have you, Avelino. <laughs> I'm also very pleased to be here. And actually, it's a pity that I'm not physically in Mexico. I would love to be in Mexico. But I hope there will be many chances in the future because of course. Uh, I really like, uh, well, my, my previous visits to Mexico were epic. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to them. So I will share my screen. Let me see yes. if I can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see it already? Yes, clearly. Okay. Okay, as Carlos said, um, I will give three lectures. So today I'm gonna give a lecture about the generalities. This is how I entitled the lecture. So general things about neutrino mass models. Uh, tomorrow we'll give a lecture um, more focused on Majorana neutrino mass models. So this is a, a general class, but a very, very wide, very wide class. And then the last day of Thursday, I will give a lecture on, um, I would say, um, maybe more phenomenological aspects. So mainly lepton fluoro violation. You will see that. Okay. In any case, it all begins with uh, this famous uh, letter that I'm pretty sure that most of you know about it. It's a letter that Pauli sent to his colleagues when he couldn't attend a meeting to discuss uh, a problem at the moment that was crucial, beta decays. Nobody could understand beta decays. But then he couldn't attend uh, the meeting because he had a ball. He was invited to a ball, this is true. And then because of that, he sent a letter with the explanation that was uh, behind this problem of beta decays. As you know, this is the, the proposal of the neutrino. So Pauli proposed the neutrino to explain uh, several aspects in beta decay, mainly uh, or more, most popularly the, the spectrum, the energy spectrum of the electrons that were emitted in beta decay. Um, it's always funny for me to, to read this letter. I don't speak German, but I, I have an English translation. And, and there are things in this letter, and, and I'm sure that most of you know about it, that are very funny now nowadays. So for example, he finds a desperate remedy to introduce a new particle to explain a problem. When nowadays we introduce not one, but tens of hundreds of new particles in a paper and we are happy and, and there is no problem with that. Instead, as you can see, Pauli was embarrassed because he was proposing a new particle that was not detected. Uh, well, you know the story, you know that uh, eventually the neutrino was detected and it was actually the explanation for um, the fact that uh, the electrons in beta decay have different energies because sometimes the neutrino takes more energy and sometimes it takes less. It's just as simple as that. But this is what uh, basically we're going to discuss uh, today. So we're going to discuss neutrinos and uh, this is the summary of this lecture, so today's lecture. So first I will give you a very brief um, um, recap of what fermion masses are in the standard model. And then I will focus more on neutrinos and what makes them special. Then I will move to the distinction between Dirac and Majorana neutrinos. And then I will say something about Dirac neutrinos and Majorana neutrinos. And then I will, I will conclude. So let me start with the, the, the way fermions get masses in the standard model. This is something that uh, I'm pretty sure will be explained much better by Jose Ignacio Illana uh, tomorrow in his lectures about the electric theory. But nevertheless, I need to say a few things. So um, as you know, uh, fermions get their masses in the standard model thanks to the Yukawa couplings to the Higgs doublet. So you have things uh, like, uh, like this one. So you have a Yukawa coupling between the lepton doublet, the Higgs doublet, and right-handed chat leptons. And after the Higgs gets a BEV, and the BEV is, is given here, so this is the BEV and this is the Higgs, this generates a mass term for the, for the chat leptons and an interaction term between the Higgs and a pair of chat leptons. Now, this mass matrix here is nothing but the Yukawa coupling multiplied by uh, the BEV of the Higgs. Okay, so this is a three by three charge lepton mass matrix, uh, total, totally general mass matrix. And in the same way, you can do um, apply the same trick and get masses for the other standard model fermions. So you get masses for the up quarks and you get masses for the down quarks. Always proportional to the Yukawa cap. Very simple, right? Now, um, I find it remarkable that the same mechanism that is behind the masses of the gauge bosons is also behind the masses of the fermions. This is a very economical feature of the standard model. In principle, they could have different origins, but I find it very interesting that it's actually the same origin, the Higgs boson. Also, I, I should mention, because this will be uh, a very important thing uh, in what follows, that in general, these matrices are not diagonal. So they, they are general matrices that one has to diagonalize 
to get the, the, the mass eigenstates and the mass eigenvalues. And this is done by means of a by unitary transformation. What this means in general is that you apply a rotation to the left-handed fields and another rotation to the uh, right-handed fields. So U and V are two independent uh, unitary uh, matrices that correspond to change of basis between gauge and mass basis. And when you apply this transformation, you go from uh, the original gauge eigenstates that I call FL and FR to mass eigenstates, which have a hat in my notation. When you do that, the mass term that uh, you generated in the previous slide, for example, this mass term, when you apply the rotation to EL and to ER, you end up with a new matrix, which is the original matrix times uh, U dagger on the left and B, B on the right. Uh, and this matrix, by definition, because you are going to the mass basis, is diagonal. So, for example, in the case of the charge leptons, you have something like this. So, this matrix will be a diagonal matrix, and the, the elements in the diagonal will be the mass of the electron, the mass of the muon, and the mass of the charge. However, um, it's very easy to see that neutrinos do not get masses by doing this, simply because there are no right handed neutrinos. So, you cannot write down a uh, Yukawa uh, term like this one because there is no uh, right handed neutrino to write here for the neutrinos. And this is basically because when the standard model was built back in the, in the 60s, uh, there was no reason to add masses for the neutrinos. Uh, at that moment, there was no indication of uh, any masses for the neutrinos. They were assumed to be zero just for economical reasons. And in fact, this is not only due to the fact that there are no right handed neutrinos, but also because the, the lepton sector in the model is, is minimal. Uh, you will see, not today, but maybe tomorrow, uh, that actually there are many extensions of the standard model that do not add right-handed neutrinos, but lead to neutrino masses. We will see how. Uh, but this is not the case of the standard model because it's very minimal, very minimal, very few ingredients. And because of that, there is also accidental lepton number conservation. So we didn't impose lepton number conservation in the model, but due to the fact that we impose the gate symmetry and that there is no right-handed neutrino and the, the lepton sector is minimal, lepton number is conserved. Uh, so the question is, is this okay? Is it fine to have uh, bodies in masses of four neutrinos? And of course, uh, the answer, as you will see, is, is no. And in fact, neutrinos is actually one of the problems uh, among others. Uh, the one that probably, in my personal opinion, is uh, the, the cleanest one in favor for an extension of the standard model. There are others, for example, dark matter, the baryon asymmetry of the universe, and others more theoretical, like the hierarchy problem, unification, flavor. But neutrino masses, is, uh, as you will see, is a very important hint in favor of extending the standard model, going beyond. And, and why is that? So there were several experiments uh, for many decades that were looking for neutrinos. For example, neutrinos coming from the sun. You know that in the sun, in the center of the sun, well, actually in the sun, uh, many nuclear reactions are taking place uh, continuously. And uh, in many of them, neutrinos are produced. Since they interact very feebly with, the, with matter, they escape the sun and they go in all directions and some of them come to, to the earth. So you can construct a model of the sun, calculate the number of neutrinos that you expect to receive, and then compare to the number of neutrinos that you actually observe. And it was found that actually the number of neutrinos that were observed were less, about a factor of one third, uh, of the of neutrinos that were expected. So there were missing neutrinos. Some neutrinos were lost somehow. Similarly, um, you can also produce neutrinos in the atmosphere. When uh, cosmic rays hit uh, a particle in the atmosphere, an atom, for example, that is uh, in the air, um, many particles are produced. For example, pions are produced. Then they decay while traveling to the Earth. And uh, in this decay, you produce, again, neutrinos. Because of that, you can estimate very easily that uh, the number of neutrinos of muon type is expected to be twice uh, as many as the number of neutrinos of electron type. And again, when people started to, to look at these things and try to find this number, they found that this ratio is actually smaller than two. So again, missing neutrinos. We don't know why. Well, we actually know why. I'm, I'm sure you know <laughs> you are familiar with this. So the, the answer, uh, the explanation for this problem is actually that neutrinos, they don't disappear, but they oscillate. What this means is that neutrinos are produced with a given flavor at the source, for example, in the sun. And then while traveling, they change the flavor. So if they are produced as electron neutrinos, 
when they travel, they can change and become muon neutrinos. Because of that, since you are expecting to receive, uh, for example, electron neutrinos, if your detector is only sensitive to this particular type of neutrinos, the ones that have oscillated, you cannot detect. And that's why you find less neutrinos than expected. This was the Nobel Prize in 2015. And this is actually one of the, I would say, major discoveries in, in, in this century, the fact that neutrinos oscillate. And, and this is very important for us, not only because it's cool that neutrinos oscillate, this is quantum mechanics at work, but also because it implies that neutrinos must have masses. So let me explain why. So as I said, the, the mechanism is very simple. So at production, you, some, you have some flavor eigenstates, for example, electron neutrinos. But these are not the same as the mass eigenstates. There is some change of basis between these two guys, between the flavor and the mass eigenstates. The evolution operator, the one that uh, you have to use in quantum mechanics to calculate how the state evolves with time, is diagonal in the basis of the mass eigenstates, not in the basis of the flavor eigenstates. Because of that, after some time, after propagation, the original state becomes a mixture of different neutrinos. And you can calculate the probability of finding a neutrino of a particular flavor, for example, alpha, flavor alpha. And you, you find, I don't give you the expression, but generically, you find that this is proportional to some mixings. So the mixing is the, the elements of the matrix that gives you the rotation between these two bases times uh, some sinus square of delta m square. So you need these masses to be non-zero. Otherwise, this effect cannot take place. Therefore, the discovery of neutrino oscillations necessarily require neutrinos to have masses, to have non-zero masses. So this is a, a crucial discovery uh, that basically tells us that the standard model cannot be complete. Uh, nowadays, uh, these parameters have been measured with uh, high accuracy. Uh, some of them better than others, but actually all of them, I would say that the, the progress has been very impressive in the last uh, 20 years, basically. And this is a table that I took from a reference that you can check. It's a reference that basically what it does is to, to take all the information coming from neutrino experiments, neutrino uh, oscillation experiments, and compile it together to get uh, the best fit values and the, the ranges for the parameters that appear in this formula. Okay, so you get, for example, experiment looking for neutrinos at the sun, neutrinos from uh, uh, the atmosphere, neutrinos from reactors, from uh, accelerators. You compile all this information together and you, you can make a global fit to all this experimental data. And thanks to that, you get these results here. So for example, you know that this delta m square uh, is basically uh, 7.5, 10 to the minus five electron volt square with these particular errors. And, and this is the two sigma range and this is the three sigma range and so on and so forth. Interestingly, there are things that we still don't know. For example, uh, Delta, which I will tell you in a moment what it is, uh, it's still allowed to, to take a very wide range. So it's not very well measured. And also very interestingly, and this is something that I would like to, to mention more explicitly, uh, current experiments are not sensitive to the sign of this particular delta m square. Okay, Because of that, we don't know whether one is heavier than three or three is heavier than one, depending on the sign. Uh, and we distinguish, distinguish between two cases. When three is heavier than one, we call it normal hierarchy. When three is lighter than one, we call it inverted hierarchy. So you can see it like this. So in normal hierarchy, we have one, two, three. We think this is normal. I think it makes sense. And in inverted hierarchy, we have three, one, two. Okay. And we don't know which one is realized in nature. We have measured these two differences, this one here and this one here, but we don't know the ordering. This is something that will be probably uh, answered by experiments in the next uh, decade or decade and a half. Now, um, I mentioned these mixings. So what are these mixings? So it's just the relation between the flavor and the mass eigenstates. As I said before, this is something that will be mentioned many times in these lectures. So the flavor eigenstates can be written as a superposition or as a combination, linear combination of the mass eigenstates. And that is given by a matrix that I call U nu, okay? And, and this is the, the quantity uh, that enters neutrino oscillation experiments. So the mixings are actually the elements of this matrix. Uh, to be more precise, actually, uh, you should also apply a rotation in the charles Leplon sector. We mentioned that before. There might be a relation between the flavor and mass eigenstates in the charles Leptons. 
when you apply a rotation uh, in both cases, so for the charged leptons and for the neutrinos, you introduce something like, uh, like this. So you get a, a product of two matrices. Uh, you E dagger coming from the charged leptons and you neutrino coming from the neutrinos. And their product is called the PMNS matrix, Ponte Corvo Maki Nakagawa Sakata matrix. Um, it's completely equivalent to the so-called CKM matrix in the core sector. And it's the matrix that appears in just uh, current interactions. So interactions with the W. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you will see this in more detail and uh, with better explanation from Jose Ignacio Llana uh, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow in his lectures. Uh, but basically, what you, you should know at this moment is that um, it's completely analogous to the, to the CKM matrix. And is the one, this is the matrix that contains the elements, the mixing angles that are measured in neutrino oscillation spheres. Um, it's so important that we typically parameterize it uh, in a very specific way. Actually, let me go back to a couple of slides. Um, so you see all these angles, theta one, two, theta two, three, theta one, three, and also this phase, delta. So these are the elements of the mixing matrix, which, are, which is typically parameterized in this way. So here, Cij means cosinus of theta ij, and Sij is the sinus of theta ij. You see that there is also a phase, because in principle, there could be a phase in this matrix. And so these are the angles, theta one, three, theta one, two, and theta two, three, that are measured in neutrino oscillations. And this phase is typically called the Dirac phase. And it's also measured, and we have some hints of a possible value from neutrino oscillations as well. Um, later, I will explain that um, neutrinos could be Majorana fermions. And in that case, actually, the most general expression for the PMNS matrix includes an additional factor. So this factor here, which is a diagonal matrix with two additional phases, alpha and beta. These two phases are typically called the Majorana phases. Okay, But this is only true if neutrinos are Majorana fermions. And this will be better uh, understood in, in some minutes. Um, a comparison to the core sector is also very interesting because uh, you probably know that in the, in the core sector, the, the CKM matrix, which is the analog of the PMNS, is very close to the diagonal. So these uh, squares basically give us an idea of how large the elements of this matrix are. So this is a three by three matrix, and you see that the, the diagonal elements are very large. Uh, in contrast, if you look at the PMNS matrix, you see that there is no clear structure. So there are large elements basically everywhere. Apart from this, part, this entry here, there are large elements everywhere. And we don't know why. We don't know the reason for this difference between the quark and the electron sectors. And it's actually one of the major, uh, I would say, lines of research in, in, in model building, in flavor model building, to be more precise, currently, trying to understand why these two things are so different. Um, one more thing that is actually very uh, interesting and remarkable about neutrinos is that they are very, very, very light. So this is a plot that I did many years ago with some, well, it's a very crappy plot. I think it, it doesn't look very nice, but I think it, it conveys a message and this is the important thing. I put here in log scale, uh, the masses of the different uh, particles in the standard model. So you have the quarks, the W and the Z boson, the Higgs. Okay, this is in log scale in, um, in a milli electron volts, sorry. And the thing is that we don't know actually uh, the mass for neutrinos. This is actually that we still don't know. We only know these mass differences, but uh, we can more or less uh, take for this particular plot 0.1 electron volt, just to give us an idea. We know that it cannot be heavier than that. It could be a bit lighter, but not heavier than that. And you see that if I do this plot, all these values are known. This is more or less estimated, or more or less uh, I put a number that I put by hand, but it should be in this range. And you see that all the particles in the standard model are more or less together. There are actually big differences among them because this is log scale, but still it's not that bad. But look at the neutrinos. They are so, so far below. They are much, much lighter than the others. Uh, and this is also something that needs to be explained. We don't know why neutrinos are much lighter than the others. So neutrinos have tiny masses, and the standard model doesn't have an explanation for that. 
uh, not only for that, but even for the fact that they have masses. So we must extend the standard model to account for neutrino masses. And this extension should not only give us neutrino masses, but also explain why they are very small. Otherwise, uh, this would look like a coincidence. Uh, and well, we basically, we don't like that. We, don't, we want to have an explanation for that. Uh, and people have put forward many possible models. Uh, the most uh, well-known ideas basically rely on the classical CISO, but there are also ideas based on low scale CISOs, on radiative models, variations uh, with dark matter that are called scotogenic sometimes, with supersymmetry, with different neutrinos. There are many, many, many of them. But don't be afraid because we will go through them step by step. We will only see the most uh, representative examples. But uh, literally, there are hundreds of papers in the literature proposing different models. It's really hard to, to cover them all. Um, now, um, I mentioned already that neutrinos could be Dirac or Majorana fermions. What does it mean? Okay, so these two guys, these two gentlemen are Paul Dirac and Ettore Majorana, very important figures in our field. Uh, well, Dirac is very well known, Majorana also very well known, but maybe not as much as, as Dirac. And they discovered two different ways to give uh, masses to fermions, or to be more precise, two different ways in which um, a fermion mass can be written in a Lagrangian that is compatible with the Lorentz symmetry. To the left, you have the form that you have seen already. So um, a bilinear term in fermionic fields, which com combines um, a left-handed fermion and a right-handed fermion. This is called a Dirac mass term, this type of, uh, of term. And this is Lorentz invariant. This is the, the one that you find, for example, in the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation contains this type of mass term that is typically represented in this way. Nothing else and something that you are very familiar with. And if you do that, um, it's easy to find that in principle, F and F conjugate, so the charge conjugated field of F are different. They are independent fields. Um, the big discovery of Ettore Majorana is that in principle, there is a different way, an alternative way to write a term for a fermion that corresponds to a mass. And it's given here. So in this case, one has some, uh, some fermion with a given chirality. X could be L or R. So any of the chiralities of this fermion. And this term here, so FC bar F, is also Lorentz invariant. It also respects the Lorentz symmetry. And therefore, you are allowed to write it in principle in your Lagrangian. This is called a Majorana mass term. And in this case, you can uh, convince yourself uh, by, by studying the properties of these uh, particular fermions or these particular spinors that the conjugated fermion corresponds to the fermion. Why is that important? Because uh, only neutral fermions can be Majorana of this type. Only neutral fermions can have a mass term of this type because you need the conjugate field to be equal to the field. And you know that conjugation changes charge. So from minus one to plus one, from minus two to plus two. Therefore, if these two are equal, the only way you can do that is if, if the charge is zero. Otherwise, this is not allowed. It would break that charge. Okay, so these are the only ways you can write a mass term for a fermion. And they have very different consequences. When you're working with Dirac fermions, as I said already, uh, F and Fc, the charge conjugated field, are different. So the particle and the antiparticle are completely independent. For instance, uh, the electron and the positron. They are two different fields. In contrast, in the case of Majorana neutrinos, a particle and the antiparticle are the same. Okay, so that's very important. Uh, and it's something that is being explored uh, in different experiments, as I will mention. Also, in the case of Dirac neutrinos, you combine in the mass term, you can see it directly, L and R fermions. So fermions with chirality left-handed and right-handed. Um, in contrast, in the case of the Majorana fermion, you use only one chirality. For example, this could be FLC, FL. And this is, again, uh, a valid mass term for this particular fermion. Because of that, since this guy requires two different um, bile fermions, so two different components, left-handed and right-handed, in the end, you have four degrees of freedom. Whereas in this case, you only have two degrees of freedom. This is a more economical way to write uh, a mass term for a fermion. And finally, uh, Dirac neutrinos conserve all U1 charges, whereas Majorana neutrinos violate all U1 charges. 
Because of that, if there is a U1 symmetry associated to leptons that we call lepton number, Dirac neutrinos would conserve lepton number, but Majorana neutrinos would violate lepton number. Actually, you would violate it in two units. Now, how can we distinguish this uh, between these two possibilities experimentally? So there is a crucial, crucial experimental test that is called neutrino less double beta decay. As you know, well, we have beta decay, a nucleus decays into a different nucleus by emitting, for example, an electron and an antineutrino. You can do it twice, emit two electrons and two antineutrinos. And this has been observed for several nuclei. Not many, because it's not a very common process in, in nature, but, but there are many nuclei where this has been observed. What has never been observed is a decay uh, of this type in which no neutrinos are emitted. And this is what we call neutrino less double beta decay. Uh, you can easily see that this process, uh, neutrino less double beta decay, you have a nucleus that uh, is converted into a different nucleus with the emission of two electrons. This, you can see, violates lepton number into units because you are emitting two leptons and nothing else. So you are violating lepton number into units. You are creating two units of lepton number in the final state that you didn't have in the, in the initial state. That's why this is associated, you can already have an intuition, uh, to Majorana fermions, to Majorana neutrinos. And there are many ways in which this can happen. For example, in this diagram here, I have one of the ways in which uh, this can happen. So one of the quarks in the nucleus can exchange uh, a W boson, which emits uh, an electron and the neutrinos annihilate each other because they are their own antiparticles and therefore they are not in the final state, okay? Uh, this is one of the possible mechanisms, not the only one, and actually might not be the dominant one, but you can easily convince yourself that this actually violates lepton number because you need this propagator here, which violates lepton number because you annihilate one neutrino with the other. How would this be observed experimentally? Well, there are many experiments looking for this. And the way you would distinguish this from the normal uh, two neutrino double beta decay is by measuring the, the energy, the combined energy of the two electrons. In the case of two neutrino double beta decay, the combined energy could be a spectrum with a minimal and a maximum. Whereas in the case of uh, neutrino less double beta decay, just due to energy conservation, this is a two body decay. So the, the combined energy of, sorry, it's a three body decay, but if you calculate the combined energy of the two electrons, this is fixed because if, in a effective way, this becomes a two body decay if you group them together. So in this, uh, in this case, the combined energy, the invariant uh, mass of the two electrons is fixed. And you can see in this plot that you would expect some peak over here. Unfortunately, the peak is not that high. It's actually much uh, tinier. And because of that, it's very hard to observe this process. And we have never observed this process, even though there are many experiments trying to do that. Now, what is important is that the observation of this process, just the observation, is enough. And there is a very nice paper that people typically call the black box theorem that tells us that if we observe this process, neutrinos must be of Majorana type. So it's enough to observe it to conclude that. There is no need for anything else. We don't know what is the internal process that is taking place. We don't know if this is the diagram of if there are other diagrams which are more important, but we know that neutrinos have to be of Majorana type and lepton number violated. However, if you don't observe uh, this process, you cannot say much because it could be that neutrinos are Dirac and therefore you don't observe this process because lepton number is conserved in nature or neutrinos could be Majorana and the lifetime of this process just be long enough so that we never observe it experimentally. This is a, a typical problem in our field. Sometimes when you don't see anything, you cannot conclude much. Now, let me now uh, concentrate on uh, direct neutrino masses. And, and by the way, I think this is a, the, a right moment to say that if you have any question, any comment, anything, you can interrupt me. Uh, of course, we can discuss later as well, but uh, don't hesitate to interrupt if you want to make a question. Eh? Really, I wouldn't mind. Okay, if you don't say, Anything, I will give you 10 seconds. Okay, uh, so let me continue. Um, now, let me say a few words about the neutrino masses. This is not the most popular way 
to generate masses for neutrinos. And you will understand why uh, later today and, and especially tomorrow. But it's also a possibility. And uh, the simplest neutrino mass model is actually to replicate what we do with the other fermions in the standard model, just with neutrinos. So in principle, we can just add right handed neutrinos. And they will be singlets of SU3. So they don't have strong interactions. They would be also singlets of SU2 left. And they would be singlets of U1 hypercharge. So they don't have hypercharge. With these uh, quantum numbers, you can write Yukawa couplings of this type. So you have the lepton doublet. You have the Higgs doublet tilde. This is because you want to conserve uh, hypercharge. Tilde means uh, basically the conjugated field, but nothing else. And then the right-handed neutrinos. So when the, when the Higgs gets a BEF, this would induce a mass term, a Dirac mass term, for the normal neutrinos. So that's it. We have solved the problem. We already have neutrinos for, sorry, masses for the neutrinos. However, mm, there are some issues if you do this. Uh, it is true that you generate masses for the neutrinos, but if you want to explain why neutrinos are much lighter than the other fields, mm, you have a problem. First, because you need to, uh, to use very small Yukawa couplings. No, you know that V, the Higgs boson bed, is around 100 uh, giga electron volts, and the mass of neutrinos is around 0.1 electron volt. So this is 12 orders of magnitude below. So you need the Yukawa coupling here to be around 10 to minus 12, a very small number. Uh, this is aesthetically not very appealing. We don't like to you have uh, in our theories such small numbers. But OK, aesthetics is not a scientific reason. So maybe, maybe this is fine. But the problem in practice is that this is not testable because um, these neutrinos, uh, um, th sorry, these couplings are so small that they wouldn't have any uh, observable effect. So there are no, no experiments that can uh, measure these Yukawa couplings because they are so tiny that you cannot, uh, for example, produce neutrinos in colliders and measure the interaction with the Higgs. So not only, as I said, not only it's an aesthetical problem that we don't like such small numbers, but also um, it's a problem with testability. This scenario doesn't have experimental consequences beyond the fact that we have neutrino masses that we know already. So we don't like this very much. And finally, and this is also very important, uh, since uh, these right-handed neutrinos are singlets, okay, I remind you, they are singlets under all gate symmetries, in principle, we can write down a term like this. So this term is actually allowed by all symmetries. You can see that the analogous term with the left-handed neutrinos is not allowed because the left-handed neutrinos belong to a doublet of SU2. So you cannot write down a term of this type because the SU2 symmetry doesn't allow you to do that. It would be forbidden. Uh, actually, to be more precise, U1 hypercharge. SU2 symmetry has a different role. But in any case, the gate symmetry does not allow you to write a Majorana mass term for the left-handed neutrinos. But there is no problem with the right-handed neutrinos. So why would you have a theory with just this Yukawa coupling and not this Majorana mass term for the right-handed neutrinos if this is allowed? In principle, you are removing this for no reason. And this has also an important consequence that you will see tomorrow, that if you add this term, things change by a lot. I don't. You don't have direct neutrino masses, but Majorana neutrino masses in there. This being said, uh, you can have direct neutrinos and still have an appealing scenario with uh, testable predictions, but you need to complicate a little bit the model. So let me tell you uh, a different model that would have direct neutrinos and at the same time would be nicer and, and, test and testable in experiments. So again, I need to add right-handed neutrinos because I need to write down a Dirac neutrino mass uh, term for the neutrinos. So I need the right-handed part. And again, I have singlet under issue three, singlet under issue two, zero hypercharge. I'm also forced for this model that I will explain now uh, to work to uh, add also two symmetries. I will have a symmetry that is just U1 lepton number. So this L stands for lepton number under which the right-handed neutrinos have charge plus one. And finally, I also add uh, a set to symmetry. You know, set to symmetry is the simplest symmetry you can have. 
a field can be charged under this symmetry as plus or minus. And you only allow terms which the product of them is plus. So you allow things like minus minus or plus plus or minus minus plus, but not, for example, minus minus minus. Minus 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 will give you minus and this is forbidden. So this is the simplest symmetry that you can add to your model. And you say you impose that this way handling neutrinos has plus charge under the set. Okay, this is like a recipe. This is a, like the ingredients you have to add to the model for, for this to work. Now, I also add two fermions that I call NL and NR. They are what people call in the literature vector-like fermions. Uh, vector-like means that the left-handed component and the right-handed component have exactly the same representations, the same quantum numbers and they're all symmetries. In contrast, for example, in the standard model, the charged leptons, they are not uh, vector-like because the left-handed charged lepton belongs to a doublet and the right-handed charged lepton belongs to a singlet. So they are not vector-like, they have different representations. Here, instead, I'm assuming that this NL and NR, they have exactly the same quantum numbers. So they are, again, singlets under SU3, singlets under SU2. They don't have hypercharge. They have lepton number equal to one. And the only difference between these guys and the right handed neutrinos is that I'm assuming that these guys have minus charge under the set two. And finally, I also need, for this model, I need also an additional scalar. Oops, sorry. I need an additional scalar that I call S. Uh, this is a singlet under everything, again. Uh, and it also has a minus charge under set two. Okay, these are the ingredients, the fields that I have to add to my model for it to work. Okay, now, why do I do this? Because so far it seems that I'm doing this just for fun and there will be no interesting result, or I'm just randomly introducing new fields. You will see why. With these symmetries here, I can add all these additional terms to the Lagrange. First, I have this Yukawa coupling between the standard model um, lepton doublet, the Higgs doublet, and NR. Okay, actually, actually this is a mistake. It's not NR, but it's actually new R. Sorry, there is a typo here. So this is the normal Yukawa coupling for the right-handed neutrinos. Uh, second, I also have a Yukawa coupling between the right-handed neutrinos and NL. Okay, so this guy over here, thanks to S. Okay, and you can check that the set to symmetry is conserved because S is minus, new R is plus, and NL is, is minus as well. So minus plus minus, the product is, is plus. So this is allowed. And of course, all the other symmetries are conserved as well. And finally, I have a, a, a Dirac mass term for these vector like fermions. So the nice thing about vector-like fermions is that their mass terms are gauge invariant because the left-handed and the right-handed components have the same representation. So you are allowed to write something like NL bar NR. This is gauge invariant because NL and NR have the same representations. And now phi will get a bef and S will get a bef. This term over here will give you a term that I call ML which is nothing but the Yukawa coupling times the web of the, of the Higgs. And this term over here will give you another mass term that I call MR, which is nothing but the product of the Yukawa coupling YR times the web of S, okay? And also you have this mass term that you had from the beginning because it was gauge invariant. You don't need any web to generate it. Uh, the resulting Lagrangian after phi and S get webs uh, contains several mass terms, as I just said, and you can write it in a compact way using matrices. So you get something like this here. So you can see that the uh, new L bar, which is here in this doublet, NL bar, which is here, new R, which is here, sorry, this is a typo, and NR, which is here. You can write the mass terms that result after symmetry breaking in this way. So you have a zero here because there is no, uh, no term linking new L and, and, and new R. Uh, sorry, actually, I said this wrong. Actually, this is an R. This is not a typo. I was confused. Sorry about that. And uh, yes, exactly. Um, 
then MR is given here and MN is given here. So you get this matrix in the end. Now, as usual, you need to go to the mass basis to calculate what are the masses of the physical fields. Uh, this matrix in general will be uh, a last matrix. For example, if you say that you have three generations of this field and three generations of this field, this would be six times six because you have six and six, three, sorry, three and three. So six elements and three here and three here, six elements. So this would be six times six matrix. However, you can diagonalize it in blocks. So what I mean is you can treat it as a two by two matrix where each of these elements is actually a matrix itself. Okay. And you can see that in the limit in which this element is much smaller than this element, and this one is actually much smaller than this one, the one of the eigenvalues of this matrix is given uh, by this approximated formula. So it's proportional to ML times MR divided by ML. And by assumption, this ratio is very small because I'm saying that the assumption that was behind this diagonalization was that MN is much larger than MR. So automatically, since this ratio is very small, automatically the result, which will be the mass of the neutrinos, will be much, much, much smaller than ML. So if, for example, I take ML to be one giga electron volt, and this ratio is 10 to minus nine, automatically I get very light neutrino masses. This is what people call the Dirac scissor. So the nice thing about this uh, construction is that you don't need to have tiny Yukawa couplings. All the Yukawa couplings here could be largest, but you need for this to work a very large scale. So MN would be a very large scale. So you would have at the same time light neutrinos and also large Yukawa couplings. Just so you would have uh, ways to test this experimentally. So this is the idea behind this setup. So I'm not going to discuss uh, Dirac neutrino masses anymore. This was just an example that I wanted to give you to, to show you that actually the fact that neutrinos are Dirac is also a possibility and that you can construct uh, models for neutrino masses in which neutrinos are Dirac without any problem, without any problem and they could be nice and testable. However, as I will discuss uh, next, they are not the most popular constructions. People prefer typically Majorana construction. You will see why. Okay, so today I'm going to say just a few words about the Majorana neutrino masses to convince you that they are actually very nice, very appealing, that you, we love them, etc. And tomorrow, if you, if you don't mind, I will, I will tell you essentially. Oh, I see now, I'm sorry, that you cannot see my pointer. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. I was pointing to some formulas and, and you couldn't see them. And you see a black horizontal bar. Mm, okay, the black horizontal bar, I think it's um, the zoom uh, menu with all your, your faces. Yes. This I don't know how to remove. Is it very bad? Uh, does it bother you to see the slides? Uh, you can try to, to stop sharing your screen and start again, maybe. Maybe that fixes the problem. Okay. Um, I think it, it would be the same, right? Yes, yeah, the same. But does it cover too much? No, no, no. The rectangle is very small. Okay, I can put it maybe in the corner so that you, it doesn't cover too much. Yes. Sorry about that. I, I had this problem before. I don't know how to, to get rid of it. Tomorrow, maybe I can try, I can try different things. Don't worry. Okay. So, um, and about the pointer, I have no idea how to make it <laughs> visible. <laughs> Don't worry. But, uh, I will remember that. So if I say, if I make a, a reference to a formula, I will try to explain it uh, so that you don't need to see the pointer. Thank you. Okay. So now let me uh, say a few words about Majorana neutrino masses. Tomorrow's lecture will be essentially dedicated to this possibility. So you will see tomorrow all the possibilities, all the zoo of models that we have for neutrino masses of Majorana type. But today, let me say a few words. Uh, this is the favorite option for, for people doing model building by far. So for each uh, Dirac neutrino mass model, you probably can find 20 Majorana neutrino mass models. 
I'm just making up these numbers, of course. I never measured this, but I'm pretty convinced that it should be something like that. Uh, and the reasons are, well, there are several reasons for that. First, neutrinos are expected to be Majorana unless some symmetry forbids lepton number violation. And it's very easy to understand that. Let me go back to the model that we just uh, built here. So you see here that we had to impose U1 lepton number. So we had to force the model to conserve lepton number. Why is that? Because if we don't have um, this symmetry in the model, we can write down uh, Majorana mass terms for all the fermions, for new R, for NL, and NR. Once we have these Majorana mass terms, which violate U1, U1L, uh, automatically neutrinos would be, as you will see tomorrow, Majorana particles and not Dirac particles. So in a way, you have to enforce neutrinos to be Majorana by, sorry, by, to be Dirac by adding this symmetry. And this is something that is not very nice. No? Like you are forcing your theory to, to give you Dirac fermions when actually when you don't do anything, automatically they are Majorana. So that's one of the reasons why most people prefer Majorana neutrinos rather than Dirac neutrinos, which are somehow forced. Also, uh, many simple uh, models for neutrino masses, I would say, not all, maybe all is too much. I wrote here all, but maybe most simple models are of Majorana type. So the, the typical example that everybody knows is the type 1C so that I will review tomorrow. And, and this model is very simple. It's so simple that some people think that it's already the model when this might not be the case. But it's actually one of the reasons behind the fact that people like Majorana models because they are simple sometimes. Also, they are more economical. You probably remember that I said that uh, Majorana fermion has uh, two degrees of freedom, whereas uh, uh, Dirac fermion has four degrees of freedom. Uh, so that's also could be an argument in favor of Majorana models. You have less degrees of freedom. They are more economical. And finally, and this will be explained in the next uh, slide, uh, Majorana neutrinos are typically favored also by effective field theory uh, arguments, as you will see in a second. But before I, I tell you that, um, let me insist once more that Dirac neutrinos, even though they are exotic, they are not uh, the most popular models in the market, uh, are possible. And I show you one example that is not very complicated and gives you uh, nice phenomenology, gives you neutrino masses. Uh, and the only way we can distinguish among them is to make experiments. There is no other way. We have to observe some uh, process, for example, neutrino less than beta decay, uh, to convince ourselves that neutrinos are Majorana. Uh, otherwise, both possibilities are open. Now, what is this argument from effective field theory? So uh, you probably know that it's uh, customary to consider the standard model an effective theory that is valid up to some energies. These energies, which are typically denoted by, by lambda, are the energies at which new degrees of freedom exist. So if you have a model with some additional particles that live at very high energies, this lambda corresponds to the masses of these particles. Um, in that case, the physics at low energies, much lower than lambda, than the masses of these particles, can be described by an effective field theory, in which the Lagrangian is given by your standard model Lagrangian plus effective operators of different, different dimensions. For example, in this formula here in yellow, the first term is the standard model Lagrangian. The second one is a collection of operators, Q, uh, of dimension five with different coefficients. The coefficient is uh, written here as C. So each C corresponds to a coefficient of an operator, numerical coefficient. Next, you have another term with operators of dimension six. And this continues, dimension seven, eight, and so on. And the funny thing, this is very interesting, Weinberg, which uh, will be missed in the community, by the way. It's actually, uh, the timing for this lecture is actually very, uh, uh, very curious because he, he just passed away. So Weinberg discovered in 1979, one of the many things that he did, one of the many contributions he did to, to our community, that at dimension five, there is only one operator that you can write with the gate symmetries of the standard model. So if you respect the gate symmetries of the standard model, there is only one operator at dimension five. And this is what everybody knows as Weimer operator. And it's given here. 
This QW is the Weimar operator. So you have two Higgs doublets, phi tilde dagger and phi tilde dagger, you have it twice, and two lepton doublets. In order to make it gauge invariant, you have to write it uh, in this particular way with some transposes, some cash conjugation. So the, the, the structure is a bit more complicated than that. But um, as you can see in red, essentially it boils down to two lepton doublets and two Higgses. And, and you can easily see that this uh, one bit operator breaks lepton number in two units, exactly like a major mass term also breaks lepton number in two units. And actually, this is not a coincidence. If I get a BEF, this term would give you major and neutrino masses uh, automatically. Just because uh, when you contract L with L, you would have a term that goes like nu C uh, bar nu C. Sorry, nu. Uh, so a major and a neutrino mass for, for your left handed neutrinos. And, and this is very interesting. The fact that the, the only operator that you can have the dimension five uh, breaks lepton number into units uh, is very powerful for several reasons. First, because um, if you take lambda to be a very large scale, automatically this will give you very light neutrinos because you see that lambda is suppressing uh, the operator. You see it in the, in the formula in yellow. The formula in yellow, the second term, you have one over lambda in front of your operator, in front of the Weinberg operator. So if lambda is very large, say 10 to the 15 g giga electron volt, for example, automatically neutrinos are very light because they are proportional to the bev of the Higgs square times one over lambda. So you get automatically very small number for neutrino masses. And this has been explored by the model builders a lot. Okay, so you cannot imagine the number of models that have been built based on this operator. So you will see tomorrow that this operator can be um, um, dressed in many different ways. So this lambda, as I said before, corresponds to the masses of some new particles that live at very high energies, well, very high, at high energies, let's say, not necessarily super high. Uh, so there are many ways in which you can get this operator at low energy. So many different realizations or ultraviolet completions for this operator. And this is what I want to tell you tomorrow. Okay. And I was a bit faster than expected. So I came to my, my summary of today. So uh, let me basically give you the message that I think is more imp most important in, in this first lecture. So the first and, and maybe the, the most basic message is that the standard model predicts that neutrinos are massless, totally massless. And this cannot be true because we have observed neutrino oscillations and therefore the standard model cannot be the final theory. We, not, we, meet, we need to extend the model somehow. We will see many ways to do that uh, to explain why neutrinos are massive. And this extension not only should account for the fact that neutrinos have masses, but also should explain why they are so small. This is very important. Otherwise, it looks like a coincidence. And we don't like these coincidences in, in our field. And there are two big families of models. There are models in which neutrinos are Dirac fermions and models in which neutrinos are Majorana fermions. Dirac models are not so popular, but they are perfectly valid. And actually, some of them, as I showed you before, are nice models that explain why neutrinos are light. They don't have small numbers and they have perfectly interesting phenomenology because they have large Ukawa capsules. In these models, however, neutrinos are not their own antiparticles, and therefore neutrino less double beta decay cannot take place. So if we observe neutrino less double beta decay, we know that neutrinos cannot be Dirac. In that case, they have to be Majorana, which is the other alternative, and is the choice that is taken by most theorists. In, in this type of models, that we will see plenty of them tomorrow, neutrinos are their own antiparticles, and then one can observe can, and this is important, neutrino less double beta decay. We may be unlucky and the, the, the rate for this process might be too low, but in principle, it is uh, a process that can take place in this case. And this is what I will discuss uh, tomorrow. And before I, I finish, um, I prepare some exercises. <laughs> this is not supposed to be homework, so if you don't want to do them, I don't mind. Uh, but I think this could be um, a nice way to practice if you are interested in this particular, in this field. And for this first lecture, I, I propose this uh, simple exercise. It's not very complicated, but it's interesting, actually. And I said already during the lecture that um, 
a Dirac fermion has four degrees of freedom and a Majorana fermion has two degrees of freedom. You can convince ourselves actually that a Dirac fermion is equivalent to two Majorana fermions which have exactly the same mass. So this is the, the exercise that I propose to you. And you can give it a try. I think this is uh, in many textbooks which are very well known. Um, if you have any problem, just let me know because I can give you the solution. I have it in, in LaTeX, so I can share it with you. Uh, but I think it's nice to try this exercise if you're interested in this, in this field. And that's uh, what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias. And now if you want to discuss, ask questions, criticize, whatever, I'm open. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Avelino. So we have uh, Pablo raising his hand. Uh, thank you very much, Avelino, for this uh, great lecture. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, <laughs> let, Pablo. Me you, let me ask you something on the on the CISO you, you discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, some might dislike the fact that a discrete symmetry is needed. Uh, is it possible to avoid this or what's your opinion on, on, on this that I said that some might dislike this? Yes, uh, for this particular version, I think you need the symmetry, but I think you can do it also without the symmetry by using additional U1s. Uh, the reason for the symmetry is that without it, you would have, um, so NL and NR would be undistinguishable from mu R. They would have exactly the same quantum numbers. And, and then um, you would get extra terms that you don't have in this way. That's basically the reason. You, you want to kill some terms to distinguish between the different fields. For example, you would have a Dirac mass term between nu R and NL. Directly, a Dirac mass term in the Lagrangian because it would have exactly the same quantum numbers. So this discrete symmetry is introduced to kill some terms. But probably you can do it without it, just introducing an another U1 or something like that. Okay, thank you. And uh, can you briefly comment on the connection of the Chuck Norris fact of the day to neutrino physics? <laughs> there is no connection whatsoever, but it's always fun to remember one of the things that made Chuck Norris uh, a great man. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Emilio, please. Hello, Professor. Uh, I have a question regarding the criticism over over the the smallness of Yukawa couplings mm -hmm. in the Dirac model. Um, what I uh, what I think is that uh, I, I want to know if there's a, a difference between the smallness of the Yukawa couplings and the uh, the fact that the that lambda in the in the Weinberg operator is is very big, like. Uh, I think that, that they might uh, lead to the same to the same place, right? Yes, thanks. That's a very good question. Uh, that's a very very good question. So, yes, in a way, it's like um, I don't want to have small coupling, so I will introduce a very large scale. So, what I'm I winning? I'm basically also introducing something that I don't want, right? Uh, I understand that. But the thing that people like about introducing large scales is that it, it matches very well what we expect about um, other problems in particle physics. For instance, we believe that there might be uh, unification of the gauge symmetries, the gauge forces at very high energies. If that is the case, there are actually particles which have very large masses. So maybe this lambda is actually related to that, related to unification. Also, there are problems related to dark matter, to the flavor symmetries of the model, not the flavor symmetry, but the flavor structure of the, of the standard model. And in, basically, in order to solve these problems, you typically introduce heavy particles. So it is true that you are introducing something that in principle you don't like. Instead of a small coupling, a very large scale. We would love everything to be light no? and, and with large couplings because then we can make experiments. But it fits very well within the general setup that we have in mind about what is beyond the standard model. That's why large scales are nicer for most people. Okay, thank you. But it's a very good, very good observation. Gerardo, please. Hi, Abelino. 
Hi. You know, thank you very much for this very nice course. Uh, I, I have a very naive question. So is there another way to distinguish the Majorana nature of neutrinos or just the observation of lepton number violation? Good point. So um, I'm not 100% sure. And actually, you have people in Mexico working on this. But there are other processes that might be connected to the Majorana nature of neutrinos. For example, you can have a meson decay to a pair of leptons. If this uh, pair of leptons has the same charge, you, you violate lepton number. So I can imagine, for example, some um, meson plus that decays to L minus L minus and some quarks. And these quarks combine to give you the charge that you need to. to to conserve electric charge. This would break lepton number. So this would be an alternative way to observe lepton number violation in two units as you need for Majorana masses. Uh, but the problem with that is that the sensitivity is not as good as for neutrino less double beta decay because these experiments have been taking place for many years and experimentalists have become very good at this and they can actually measure lifetimes which are super large, 10 to the many years. So I don't remember the, the number now, sorry. In contrast, all these other processes that could also give you lepton number violation in two units, um, they, they, when you compute the rates for these processes in terms of uh, the fundamental parameter that gives you Majorana masses, for example, you see that they don't have the rates yes. large enough to compete with neutrino less double beta decay. It's a practical thing, if you want. You expect to observe before yeah, yeah. neutrino less double beta decay. Yeah, I know. But I, I was thinking uh, something different to mm -hmm. lepton number violation. Yeah, because um, I, I was thinking maybe something like I, I was reading something about the electromagnetic properties of neutrinos, but I, ah. I, I don't know if this can be possible to be measured in the future or this is. Uh. And that's also yeah very good yes 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 you are correct um, mm -hmm. yeah. there are also differences in the simply because with a majorana fermion and with a dirac fermion you can write down different um, effective operators you are allowed to write different operators and in particular um, uh, the operators that you can write down for a majorana neutrino or for a dirac neutrino with photons have different properties and so in principle by by measuring some of the electromag electromagnetic properties of neutrinos you could in principle distinguish. But I yeah. think this is even more complicated, but I'm not an expert about this. So I cannot give you a very good answer, but in principle, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. Pablo, your yeah. hand is still raised. Do you want to? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm low. Okay. <laughs> then Fabio, Fabi, please. Yeah, thank you. Um... My question is, if, if the neutrinos are, are, uh, are Majorana, then we can say that leptogenesis is the answer for the matter-antimatter asymmetry? Mm, you need neutrinos to be Majorana for leptogenesis to work. Uh -huh. But if neutrinos are Majorana, you need additional ingredients. So it's not enough. Okay. But of course, it would be a great push in favor of leptogenesis to observe between a little bit of decay, because you would get at least one of the ingredients for the recipe, the progenic recipe, to work. But okay. it's not enough, no? You need also a large CP violation, and for okay. this, it's not that trivial. You need also the, the phase transition to have some properties. But yes, it would be a good ingredient, or yes, <laughs> it would be welcome for people doing leptogenesis. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, please open your microphones to give an applause to Avelino. See you tomorrow, Avelino. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we continue with the new physics and neutrino session. Our next speaker is Alexis Plasencia. Hello, Alexis. Welcome. Hi. Hello. I will uh, share my screen.
Okay, your screen is visible. Can you see the pointer as well? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, okay, so we have Alexis Plasencia. He's a postdoc in Case Western Reserve University. And he will talk to us about probing quark lepton unification with leptoquark and Higgs decays. Welcome again. And uh, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction and and the invitation to give a to give a talk. So I'm going to be talking about work uh, with Pavel Filavias Perez and his student Elliot Golias, both at Case Western, and Clara Murgi, who is now at Caltech. And I'll be discussing uh, mostly these these two papers here. So what's the, the aim of the talk? So I want to to present and discuss uh, simple relations between the decay widths of of the leptoquarks, the scalar leptoquarks, and the Higgs bosons that can be used to, to test the idea of unification of, of quarks and leptons at the TV scale. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll start by reviewing uh, what's uh, this uh, theory of Patu Salam, where quarks and leptons are, are unified. And then I will, I will present these uh, relations between the decay widths for the leptoquarks and also the relations uh, for, for Higgs decays. And in the final part of the talk, I will uh, discuss how this theory can also be used to, to address the flavor and the muon G minus two experimental anomalies that probably you have, you have heard of. And I'll, I'll finish with the conclusions. Okay, so quark lepton unification, this idea goes back to Yogesh Pati and Abdul Salam in 1974, where they proposed to extend the, the gauge group in the standard model to an SU4 cross SU2L cross SU2 right. So you can see already that there is this left-right symmetry in the theory, uh, but more importantly, there is a matter unification in the sense that now leptons are seen as the fourth color, right? So we have uh, the three colors uh, of the strong interactions, but now in the same representation, we can have the neutrinos and the electrons. Right, and because of the symmetry, we also have a right-handed neutrinos, but there is too much symmetry in the sense that in the theory, the, the, the neutrino Dirac mass term is actually determined by the top quark you have. So that means that neutrinos are very heavy unless there is a, a cancellation and implementing the type one CISO requires the Patisalam breaking scale to be very high. So this is, a, 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 in the minimal theory, there is this high scale for, for unification. So how, how can we lower this scale? How can we achieve this uh, unification at a lower scale? So this, uh, this was proposed by Pavel, Filavis Perez, and Mark Weiss uh, some years ago where they consider a minimal, so they consider a subgroup of Patrisolam, SU4, process U2L, cross U1R. So you can see that this has the same representation. This is in the fundamental four of SU4 and SU2 doublet, that's what the two is for, and doesn't have any charge on the U1R. But now the right-handed fields are separated into FU and FD. So we have the up type quarks with the right-handed neutrinos in a four bar singlets of SU2 and carry minus one half for, for the U1R, which will lead to the electric charge after, after the breaking. And then we have FD with the down type quarks, the right-handed leptons, charged leptons, uh, in the same in the same representation with a different U1R charge because now these these guys are going to have a, an electric charge, right? Well, well, this is neutral. So 
So as I mentioned before, there is this issue that, you know, the mass, the Dirac mass of the neutrinos uh, is, is, the, is the same. You can see here Yukawa 1, Yukawa 1 is predicted to be the same as the, as the up, up type quarks, unless there is a huge cancellation between these two terms, right? Because we have to go from the 100 GeV scale to the, to the electron ball scale. This was discussed in detail by, by Avelino, how there's this huge gap between, between the masses. So here the idea is to, to, to implement the, the inverse CISO mechanism within this theory. So this needs uh, three new singlet fields, S. So now S is, is a singlet and we can write this new Yukawa with FU. Chi is a scalar that breaks the, the gauge group into the standard model. And then we can write this mu, this mass term, right? Mu SS this is the major and a mass term, and mu is, uh, is, is, is a very small parameter. And in the limit of very small mu, the, you know, we have this symmetry of, of S, you know, S as a C2 symmetry that, that is recovered. Uh, furthermore, uh, this texture of the matrix, so you can see there are these zeros here is, uh, is motivated by the gauge symmetry of the theory, right? So that's, I think that's a nice, nice motivation to have at these, the matrix for, for the inverse CISO. And then the mass of the neutrinos is proportional to this mu parameter, which is, which is small. The mass, the Dirac mass, which is order electroweak and divided by the mass, the Dirac mass that comes from chi, so this term here, which is uh, the high scale and by high, I mean, uh, hundred thousands of TV. So 10 to the six GV. So just to, to summarize this first part, you know, in this uh, theory of quark lepton unification in Patti Salam, we can have the type one C. So, but this type one C, so, you know, because Ayukawa is order one, then they had the scale happens to be very high, right? 10 to the 12 GV. Uh, but we can lower this uh, scale by, by implementing uh, an inverse CISO mechanism, which now allow, allows us to, to break at the lower scale. And then from experimental bounds from the, from the lifetime of the K meson, we, we get this bound of 10 to the six more or less, which, which depends on the, on the values of the, of the gauge couplings, of course. And in the end, we, have, we end up with three heavy uh, pseudo Dirac mass, mass eigenstates which have this mass uh, proportional to the web of, of Chi. And this theory I will be discussing that has you know, a smaller gauge group and, and the inverse C, so can be seen as a, as a low energy limit of, of the Patti Salam theory. So this is the, the gauge group here, SU4 cross SU2L cross CU1R. And I'll try to move this bar here. And the gauge bosons are in the adjoint representation. This is a 15 under SU4, singlet and SU2, and no, no U1R. And you can see that this contains the gluons. So the GMU are the, the standard gluons in the, in the standard model of the, of the strong force. There is also a, a B prime. So there is a new massive gauge boson. And also the X mu, and the X mu is a vector left quark. So left to quark just refers to the fact that this is coupling to quarks and leptons in each vertex, right? So in each vertex, we have the X mu, which is a, the gauge boson coupled to QL and, and the leptons, right? Both in our SU2 doublets and UR neutrinos and down type quarks and the charged leptons. Furthermore, there is this scalar which acquires a BEP, just like the Higgs, but this is happening at a higher scale. This uh, scalar is in the fundamental of SU4, and it's responsible for breaking this gauge group into the standard model uh, gauge group. Now, uh, we, we need to be able to explain the, the fermion masses uh, 
in, in the standard model. And in order to do this, we need to add a new scalar representation, which is uh, also in that joint representation in the 15. It's an SU2 doublet and it carries you on our charge. So this new scalar representation allows us to write a new Yukawa interaction, so Yukawa 2 and the Yukawa 4, that now we can, we can have you know, different masses for the down type quarks and the charged leptons. Because without this, without this scalar, you know, there, these masses are also predicted to be equal, right? Because of the, of the quark lepton symmetry. And we know that's not the case, right? We know that the down type quark masses are very different from the charged lepton masses. And this new uh, adjoint it helps us break that degeneracy, right? When we compute the masses, they one computes the trace of the generators, and then we have these different, different um, contributions. So then we can we have a freedom to actually fit the masses, and we can achieve you know the realistic masses for the for the charge fermions in this level. So this phi is, uh, is a 15 representation in, S, in SU4. So it actually can be separated in different blocks. And I'll be focusing on phi three and phi four. So these two elements are the scalar leptoquarks. So they are also coupled to, to quarks and leptons on each vertex. And this phi three is, uh, is a three bar in, in SU3 in the strong force and SU2 doublet and carries hypercharge of minus one six. So when written in its, in its two elements, we have the phi three has a component with one third electric charge and minus two thirds of electric charge. Now phi four has these two components. The upper component has electric charge of five thirds and the lower component an electric charge of of two thirds. So the Yukawa interactions that I have written before, they respect this, this uh, gauge symmetry and are written like this. So this is Yukawa two with FU and Yukawa four, which has phi dagger with FD. And after expanding in its components, we have uh, these two Yukawa, for phi three and phi four, and these two for phi three dagger and phi four, four dagger. But an important point here is that these two kawas are related because they come from a, new, from a UV theory that has a, a higher symmetry. So these two kawas are the same. And that can tell us some information about, about the UV theory behind this, these left quarks. Because, for example, when we look at the decay of uh, this guy, phi three, into a down type quark and a charged lepton, this vertex is actually complicated, right? Because we need to go to the to the physical eigenstate, so we need to introduce these uh, matrices that diagonalize the mass the mass matrix. So this actually depends on the PMNS, these unknown UB matrices N and D. And, and they are, you know, these are like complicated expressions that we don't even know because N and D are, are you know, we don't, we don't know. We, we know the PN and S to some extent. But here, you know, a, a crucial and simple point is that by summing over all the families, so when you sum over the three families, then you can use the unitarity of these matrices, right? So we know that these are unitary matrices and then these results are simplified. So then I can write that when, when I write this decay and I sum by the three families, this is a simplified result that doesn't, it only depends on the trace of you have a four dagger, you have a four. And I can do something similar for five, four uh, and its components. And because of the quark lepton symmetry between these, uh, these two lepton quarks, then we find this uh, simple 
relations, you know, between these uh, decay widths. So here you can see that the total decay width of phi three that has electric charge of one third into anti down quarks with a neutrino is equal to the ratio of the masses. So the masses have to be there times, you know, the total decay width of phi four with electric charge two thirds into anti charge leptons and down type quarks. And furthermore, the phi four that has electric charge of five thirds decaying into E bar U is equal to the ratio of the masses and the sum of the decay of phi three into U bar N plus, you know, the decay width into D bar E. Uh, this second relation is assuming that these, uh, the pseudo Dirac pair are, are light. So these guys have to be very light for this decay to be, to be open. And also the mass has to be very small for this relation to hold, right? Because we want this kinematic factor to be very small, which is always the case for the standard model fermions. But some, some relations I find uh, more interesting is that if, when we look, you, you look at the lightest elements of phi three and phi four. So let's say phi three one third and phi four five thirds are the small are, are the lightest. Then these are the only decays. These are the dominant decays that determine the lifetime. And then we have these uh, nice relations between the lifetime and the mass. So the product of the mass and the lifetime is equal for phi three and phi four. And these relations I find interesting because you know the mass and the lifetime are two of the of the first properties that we can infer from from particle colliders right so just the lhc right so, so the mass and how long this particle lives that's like something we can measure you know more or less straight away so this relation also holds for you. So for example, if these two guys are the lightest elements, then we have this relation, right? Between the product of the mass and the lifetime. So I also, I, I didn't mention, but phi, this phi field, which is, you know, a 15 representation also contains a second Higgs doublet. And this second Higgs omelet is coupled both to the up type quarks and the down type quarks. So we have a two Higgs omelet model, which is very general, and that's usually referred in the literature as a type three two Higgs omelet model, right? That, that's, that's the name, the type three. However, this is a, a bit special because this has a quark lepton unification, so it has a relation between the Yukawa couplings. So you can see there are four Yukawa couplings instead of eight. And once again, you know, this allows us to, to write some relations between the total decay widths. And here you can see more explicitly, you know, this symmetry between quark and, quarks and leptons, right? So here the decay of the heavy Higgs into down type quarks is equal to the decay of the heavy Higgs into, into charged leptons. And you may think this is a bit like obvious from the fact that we have quark lepton symmetry, but as far as we know, this was this hadn't been pointed out in the in the literature, right? The fact that summing over i of their the families, all these uh, unknown mixing matrices cancel out, and we have this you know exact relation between these two decay weights. And in the limit of large time beta. So this just means that the BEV of the second Higgs is much larger than the BEV of the first one. Then we can even relate the decay widths of, of left to quarks and heavy Higgs, right? So here we have a decay of phi four into antineutrinos and an up quark. The, these uh, masses and the decay of H into U bar U. 
And therefore, we can use uh, these relations to probe the idea of uh, quark labs and unifications, right? So particle colliders such as the LHC are looking for heavy Higgses, a scalar left to quarks. And the question is, how can we know that these scalars are coming from a theory that has quark lab unification? Well, we can measure these decay weights and actually see if these relations hold. And that would provide a hint that these theories come from, from quark lepton unification. So for the final point of my, of my talk, it's going to be a bit more uh, speculative and saying that, you know, um, it's been uh, over the news and, you know, there, there seem to be hints of, of new physics in, uh, in the decay of B mesons and in the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And actually, you know, the, like one of the best uh, motivated explanations is actually having a scalar left of quarks. So regarding the flavor anomalies, this is uh, corresponding to B to S transitions. And the, the, the point is to measure, you know, a clean observable, because this is QCD, these are meson decaying into, into meson and leptons, these are semi-leptonic decays, and this is, you know, there is a lot of QCD involved, so it's hard to make a, a clean prediction. However, if we measure this ratio, the ratio between the decay of the B meson into muons and the B meson into electrons, then, the hadronic effects cancel, right? Because we have the same in the numerator and denominator. So the hadronic and the long distance effects, they cancel almost exactly. And this ratio is predicted to be one, very close to one in the standard model. And as you, as you know, you know, earlier this year, uh, the LHCB collaboration announced a, an update with more data on these, on this observable RK. And here you can see that, you know, this is 0 0.846 with these error bars. And this has a 3.1 sigma deviation from the standard model, right? So this is lower than, than, than one and has a small error bar. You can see that other experiments have much larger error bars. Bavar also sees a lower value, but Bell sees uh, something close to one. So no one knows, no one knows that this is not um, definitive evidence at all. So there needs to be uh, more, more data, more statistics, you know, independent observations. But in the future, you know, in the next, in the coming years, uh, this will be clarified. But in the meantime, we can uh, use this uh, scalar left to parks because they precisely induce these B to S transitions. So here's a phi three uh, with electric charge minus two thirds. Uh, we can integrate out this field and get this, this operator here that is precisely, precisely what we need. So phi three leads uh, to, to C10 prime and C9 prime. So this C10 prime is just a Wilson, Wilson coefficients for a specific uh, Wilson operators for these fermions. And we can do the calculations for RK. Uh, we use the form factors from these uh, two papers and, you know, simplifying these expressions just to be written in terms of the Wilson coefficients, they read like this. And this uh, also modify the observable, the decay BS to, to L plus L minus. And the expression uh, we have is, is right here. So we need to check that this is also, you know, consistent with, with the experiment. It just so happens that the LHCB also sees a bit of a deviation in this channel. It's much smaller, it's like less than two sigma. But, but the point is that there is room. There is room for these uh, coefficients to be, to be, to be large. However, you know, these uh, phi three are coupled to all the quarks and all the leptons. 
So we actually, we need to avoid some experimental bounds from, from K long to mu E and also tau decays. So we can do that by saying that the, the coupling, uh, which are determined by this matrix here, have this form. So these points are very small entries and the, the squares are large entries, which are the ones needed to explain uh, the flavor the flavor anomalies. Uh, with phi four, we also have an issue of uh, lepton flavor violation. And that, is, that has been measured very, very precisely. So this constraint is very strong. You know, uh, the constraint of a muon decaying into an electron and a photon that branching ratio has to be less than 10 to the minus 13. So this actually places a strong bound that forces us to couple phi four only to electrons. So the first case is uh, coupling only to electrons or only to the muons. But that's okay. So here I'm showing you on the vertical axis the coupling to the electrons. I think I was muted. So yeah, so here I'm showing you uh, the on the on the horizontal axis the C prime the coupling to the muons, and this is a coupling of phi four, which uh, we are fixing to be one half C prime, the coupling of phi three. And the different bands correspond to, to reproducing uh, the observables, different observables, right? So the orange band correspond to the decay BS to mu mu. The blue one is the, 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 this measurement of RK. The green one is uh, RK star, so there's also the, the decay into the K excitation. And the red one is uh, the same RK star, but uh, when, when computing this RK, one integrates over, over the momentum. And these are different windows. So our, the red one is for a low Q square window, and the, the green one is for the higher Q square window. And here you can see that there is an overlap of all the observables at these, in this region here. So where the Wilson coefficients are more than five, here minus five, here minus seven or so. But then, you know, all the, the, the these observables can be uh, can be in agreement with experiment, you know, by, by adding these, these two effects. And the anomalous magnetic of the moment has also been uh, announced right recently by, by the Fermilab mu and g minus two collaboration. Where they, this is the red point here, they seem to agree with a pre previous measurement from uh, Brookhaven. And combining these two, two measurements, uh, this is 4.2 sigma away from, from the standard model prediction. Um, I also should point out here that making this prediction is very complicated because uh, there are also QCD effects entering in the loops. So there is still, uh, this is an ongoing effort, you know, by by people doing a lattice and, and other approaches, you know, using uh, experimental measurements to make uh, this this prediction here. But uh, in this uh, theory, we have this five four with electric charge five thirds, which has a nice an, an, an enhancement by the top work max. That's because this left of work can be coupled to both chiralities. So meaning we are coupled to the left-handed top and the right-handed uh, up quarks as well. So we have this second contribution, which is proportional to M top. And this is uh, what, you know, gives us the possibility to, to explain this, this deviation here. So there are new new couplings, these uh, couplings to the right-handed fields. So by saying that these two are 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 you know the same with opposite sign, 
So we need to make an assumption at least in this and this and these parameters if we want to make nice plots. So then we can make this nice plot where I'm showing you the mass of phi four. You can see it has to be at the multi TV scale, you know, few TVs. And the coupling lambda L is, or it's a, it's 0 0.05, you know, it's like between 0, 0 0.01 and order 0 0.1. So this is a small coupling. And these uh, Wilson coefficients uh, explain, you know, the flavor anomalies, RK, RK star, it's compatible with BS to mu mu, and also explains uh, the G minus two of, of the mu. So I think this is this is uh, this is nice, and the phi four carries uh, a strong strong charge. So, so these leptoquarks can be produced at the LHC through this uh, strong interaction. And that's uh, so. Now I go to the summary. So just to conclude, so I discussed this minimal theory that has quark lab unification that can live at the at the multi TV scale. And it can be seen as low energy limit of, of the Patti Salam theory. I discussed some relations between the decay widths of these scalar leptoquarks. And you know uh, more um, a more speculative idea is that this can be used to explain the recently reported uh, experimental anomalies on RK and the mu and G minus two. And if a scalar leptoquarks are discovered in the near future, then we can use this uh, relation to actually infer whether the underlying theory is a theory of uh, quark lepton unification. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexis. We have time for a question from the audience. You can ask directly by turning on your microphone. Nice talk, says Avelino. I agree. I actually have a question. What are the, the current experimental uh, bounds for this kind of uh, leptoquarks? I say, yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a good question because as I mentioned, you know, these are, they carry color, right? So they can right. be searched for at the LHC and the currents bound are at one TV. So that's why we, this, this plot is above uh, 1.5 TVs, I think. So it also depends on the, on the Yukawa interactions. Once the Yukawas are too large, then you can also look for, for indirect um, effect on, on measurements. Okay. So yes, it's uh, more or less our, our own one TV. That's uh, the current bound on this lab work. Great, great. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, please open your microphones and let's give uh, Alexis uh, an applause. Thank you very much. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Jorge Torres. Please, Jorge. Hi, Carlos. Hello. Okay. Jorge is currently a postdoc in Yale. And he's going to talk us about turning into cosmogenic neutrinos on the radio. Welcome, Jorge. Nice to see you again. Nice and to see you, Carlos. You can start now. Thanks. Yeah, first of all, I want to um, uh, th uh, thank the organizer for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Uh, I will talk about how we can detect neutrinos at the highest energies uh, with the, the so-called cosmogenic neutrinos, <clears throat> sorry, by observing radio waves emitted with, when these neutrinos interact with uh, dielectric medium. Let me just give a, a brief, uh, to put things in context, uh, when, when we hear the word, astro the word astronomy, we usually think about, you know, looking at the sky, seeing the light from stars, or even pointing telescopes at the sky. Maybe that's what uh, Van Gogh thought when he painted the uh, starry night. However, uh, there are some limitations on how much we can see with, uh, with photons, 
or with optical telescopes. This uh, graph on the right, uh, on the x-axis, you can see the energy of a photon in EV. Uh, and on the y-axis, the, the distance that, that this photon travels in megaparsec. This section in white uh, corresponds to the, uh, the area or the universe that we can see with these photons. But as you can see, as these photons become more energetic, the range that we can see becomes smaller. And this is what uh, this black region corresponds to. This is the region of the universe that is opaque to photons. And as you can see at about 10 to the 15 EV, we cannot even see further than the galactic center, which is you know, important to do uh, uh, astrophysics at the highest energies. Uh, the good news is that this region that it's opaque to photons is uh, transparent to neutrinos. And this is what the field of uh, neutrino astronomy does. It, it, uh, it studies a distant, distant and energetic universe, which cannot be done with an optical telescope. And this is allowed because, as, as we all know, neutrinos are neutrally charged and they have small perceptions, so they, they, they can travel through the universe uh, undisturbed. Uh, so maybe this is a, um, a complementary talk to what uh, Professor Paolo Lipari talked about previously. So these, these neutrinos are created direct, either directly inside uh, these sources and they are emitted and reach the Earth, or some very extremely energetic processes happen inside these astrophysical sources, and they accelerate uh, cosmic rays, which are uh, charged particles. So they, they get accelerated and they get emitted. Um, so these cosmic rays will eventually escape uh, the source, but they are confined uh, to a radius of 50 megaparsecs. Uh, there, and this is because during the propagation, uh, they will likely interact with a cosmic microwave background photon here, or a photon from the extragalactic uh, light, and it will produce uh, pions. Uh, these pions will uh, eventually decay into, into electrons, uh, muons, uh, photons, and also neutrinos. We call this the, the GZK mechanism. Uh, so electrons and muons, which are uh, charged particles, will uh, get deflected by, by extragalactic magnetic fields, or they will interact with other particles, and they will uh, disappear, or they will never uh, reach the Earth. Uh, similarly, uh, photons above, above uh, 10 to the 15 eV get attenuated. Uh, they decay into a, an electron-positron pair, and they do not reach the Earth. On the other hand, neutrinos, again, because they are not charged and because of the smaller cross-sections, can potentially be detected in the Earth, giving us information about uh, where they came from and about, about, about the, cosmic, the, the cosmic rays uh, that produced them. So if we detect these neutrinos, we can tell things about the cosmic rays, and we can tell us things about these astrophysical uh, objects. Uh, but there is more. Ultra-high energy neutrinos are also important for uh, fundamental physics. Uh, this figure is uh, uh, by Ackermann and others. The x-axis, we have the, the, the log 10 of the energy in EV, and the y-axis corresponds to the, the travel distance of these neutrinos uh, in the log 10 of the travel distance of these neutrinos in meters. Uh, the y-axis corresponds, sorry. And as you can see, ultra-high energy neutrinos belong to this area. So they have energies greater than uh, 10 to the 17 EV, which uh, uh, curiosity is the same kinetic energy that a baseball has traveling at about 100 miles per hour. And the distances that these, these neutrinos travel are uh, of the order, or the order of gigaparsecs. Uh, because these ultra high energies, we can study phenomena at energies that human made accelerators, for example, the LHC cannot achieve. Uh, we can, for example, measure the neutrino cross section at those uh, ultra high ener energies, or we can study fundamental symmetries at these uh, highest energies. Uh, similarly, because of the uh, cosmic baselines or the baselines of giga gigaparsecs that these neutrinos travel, small effects uh, can become observable and leave uh, imprints on the neutrino flux. For example, neutrinos inter uh, having uh, secret interactions or interacting with uh, dark matter uh, will we can detect these by, by measuring the flux. 
Um, okay, so, so all this is very exciting, but there are some challenges that have not allowed these particles to be detected yet. Uh, one of them is that you know, they barely interact, even though the cross-section grows uh, with energy, uh, the cross-sections of uh, these, the highest energies are the order of 10 to the minus 32 squared centimeters, which still is, is pretty low. And uh, furthermore, they have very small fluxes, as you can see here on the plot on the right, which is on the y-axis, the neutrino flux uh, in these units as, as a function of the neutrino energy. And the neutrinos I'm talking about live here where this uh, purple oval is. Uh, as you can see, their fluxes are about 40 orders of magnitude uh, smaller than, than solar neutrinos, for example. Uh, on the lower, uh, the lower plot on the left, I have a, a similar plot, but I, I've included the, the neutrino cross-section. I'm convolving the neutrino cross-section in these calculations. So if you focus on the vertical axis on, on the right side, which is this green axis, you can see that we expect about one uh, event every 10 years for one of the experiments that is already running and that I, that I will talk about later. Uh, so this means that detectors of the order of 100 cubic kilometers are needed to ensure statistically significant detections. Uh, IceCube, for example, which is uh, this detector that I have here, uh, is an experiment that is at the South Pole. It has uh, optical modules installed at two kilometers deep into the ice, and the volume of this detector is of one uh, cubic kilometer. Uh, however, this experiment is not sensitive enough at the highest energies, so ice cube is only sensitive to energies uh, below 10 to 15 EV, and rescaling this experiment by a factor of 100 will be very, very expensive. Uh, luckily, we have found a way uh, to overcome uh, these challenges. Uh, and what one of these ways is by measuring, uh, observing asterion radiation. So this asterion radiation by, was, post, was post, post, postulated by uh, Russian physicist uh, Jurgen Asterion in 1962. And it, uh, it says that uh, particles traveling faster than light in, in a dielectric medium, for example, ice, will produce a shower of secondary particles. And this uh, shower uh, will contain a charge anisotropy and will thus emit radiation in uh, the radio frequency. Uh, this effect was observed in, in the year 2000. So this uh, technique is relatively new, uh, where uh, these people, these folks, uh, directed a beam of high energy photons into a target of, uh, made of sil sil silica sand. And the interaction of these photons in the target uh, created uh, a shower. And this shower, uh, they observed, they measured with antennas uh, the, the, the radiation. Um, so that's, that was the observation of these effects in the, in the year 2000. And then how, how do we translate these into an experimental design uh, for the detection of these ultra high energy neutrinos? Well, uh, to do this, we need to understand uh, the physics of, of this radiation. So uh, when an electron neutrino, assume this, this electron neutrino arrives in the eyes and it happens to interact, um, it will, it, it, and assume again that it this, this interacts via a charged current rate, uh, interaction, which uh, whose Feynman diagram is here on the right, it will produce a charged lepton, in this case, an, an, an electron. And at, at the highest energies, at these very high energies, uh, this corresponds to a deep inelastic scattering. So the, it is going to fragment the, the nucleon and uh, the nucleus, sorry, and the resulting lepton uh, is going to be uh, ultra relativistic. So as uh, Professor Lepari explained um, previously, uh, this lepton will undergo energy losses. Uh, this plot on the right shows uh, predom predominantly uh, loss, uh, loss mechanisms. And one, as you can see, the, the, the one that uh, predominates here is the Bremsstrahlung. So this means that this electron will produce uh, photons. And then these photons will undergo, uh, will kick out electrons from the atoms via uh, photonuclear uh, interactions. And this will create a, an electromagnetic cascade, which is uh, similar to what uh, Professor Lipari uh, described, but because this is in dense medium, uh, this shower is gonna be of the order of 10 meters long, and it will have a, a spread of about uh, 10 centimeters. So in the, in the end, we, we will have this, this electromagnetic shower and other mechanisms that I described, I'm, I'm naming here, 
will deer at a net negative charge of about 5% in, in these showers. So this is important because if you remember from uh, electromagnet electromagnetism, uh, we know that a an accelerating charge, in this case, a deaccelerating charge uh, will emit radiation. Uh, now, uh, this radiation will destructively interfere for uh, wavelengths much smaller than, than, than the radius uh, here, which was 10 centimeters. So this corresponds to optical light. So we won't observe this optical light, but on the other hand, uh, this radiation will coherently add uh, for, uh, for uh, wavelengths much larger than this uh, radius, which we call the Mollier radius, which is uh, 10 centimeters. So we will observe, uh, what, we, 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 what we will observe are these uh, radio waves that can uh, eventually can eventually reach our detector. Uh, so the resulting radiation is uh, coherent. And because of that, we can give an estimate of the energy of the primary neutrino by measuring the amplitude of this signal. Uh, so the property of, properties of this signal is that it's a broadband pulse uh, within the order of megahertz to a few gigahertz. And it has a, dur a duration of uh, a few nanoseconds, which uh, resembles a, you know, a sharing of emission in the sense that there will be a, a sharing of cone but uh, in this case, the radiation is maximal at the radiation, of, at the, at the, sorry, at the sharing of cone, uh, which is about 50 degrees in ice. Uh, again, this radiation is in, in the radio band of the electromagnetic spectrum, so we can use antennas to observe these uh, neutrinos. Uh, that's the reason of, of my, my uh, talk title. We can uh, tune into neutrinos on the radio. And to accomplish this, we utilize antennas and the Antarctic, conti Antarctic continent as a detection medium. Uh, we can either fly antennas uh, above the ice by using uh, balloons, which is what the, the ANITA experiment does, which I have a picture here, uh, or we can dig holes into the ice and place the antennas as we do uh, with a couple of experiments that uh, I'm gonna talk about later. As I mentioned previously, uh, uh, current optical detectors do not have enough, enough sensitivity uh, to these higher energies due to the, the, the very small flux of these ultra high energy, energy neutrinos. But uh, using a scalar radiation as a detection mechanism can help us overcome this problem. And this is because radio frequency uh, light or radio waves can travel about 10 times farther as optical light before uh, being attenuated. So uh, as an example, uh, light, optical light is attenuated after traveling about 100 meters in ice. So ice cube can only see a distance of 100 meters or one of, no, sorry, not ice cube, one of the optical modules of ice cube can only see 100 meters in one direction. Uh, whereas a radio frequency can travel about one kilometer uh, before being attenuated. So if you convert this to volume, this means that one of these antennas is gonna observe 10 to the three times more eyes than uh, these optical detectors that IceCube uses. And the, the other advantage here is the cost. Uh, antennas are cheaper. For example, uh, one of these optical modules of IceCube costs about uh, $1,000 versus $100 that uh, one antenna uh, costs. Uh, and regarding the medium, we can virtually use the whole Antarctic continent as an interaction medium. So that, that's why we, we do this in, in Antarctica. And the other reason is that Antarctica is a, a relatively radio quiet place uh, compared to other uh, places in, in the Earth. Uh, so there are a couple of experiments I'm going to talk. I'm going to focus my talk on the, on the R experiment or the Ascalian radio array experiment, which is the experiment that I worked on during my PhD. Uh, this experiment consists of five stations that you can see here next to uh, the ice cube station, next to the ice cube experiment that have been deployed in stages uh, since 2012. Uh, and each station, you can see here a picture of a station, each, station, each, each, each station consists of about 16, of 16 antennas, sorry, that are deployed in, in, deployed in four strings, as you can see here. And each string contains uh, two horizontally polarized antennas and two vertically polarized antennas, as you can see in this figure. Uh, the fact that we have antennas of different polarization is because we want to measure uh, 
the direction of, of this signal. And it is going to help us to, to understand uh, or to constrain the direction of, of the neutrino itself. Uh, and our station records about seven events per second. Uh, however, more than 99.999% of, uh, of this data is either noise or, or uh, calibration events. So we have to find a way to distinguish these uh, between a neutrino, which is something we did uh, in, in this work, which uh, was a diffuse search for ultra high energy neutrinos for four years of data uh, using stations two and station three or A2, A3 respectively uh, of the Scarian rate of array. Uh, there's a uh, spoiler here is that we did not find any neutrinos and, and that's okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention why uh, later, but uh, as I mentioned before, Aura has a trigger rate of about seven Hertz. So seven events per second. Uh, which yields about 10 to the eight events per year uh, per station. So station two and station three have been collecting data steadily since uh, the year of 2012. So this means about 10 to the nine events uh, for these uh, four years of data. Uh, this plot on the right uh, shows the uptime of the, the stations as a function of date for uh, station two and station three. As you can see, uh, most of the downtimes correspond to the beginning of the year. And this is because uh, this is when our team, our operations team was down at the South Pole performing some maintenance to the station or, or deploying uh, other, other stations. Uh, however, the, the, the net uptime for those uh, four years is uh, of 78% for uh, station two and 74% for uh, station three. Uh, Again, because we expect the best of the majority of these events to be noise, uh, we need a way to reject them uh, in, a, in a quickly and cheaply way, computationally speaking. So for this, we use a, a, a very uh, fast SNR filter. You can see this plot on the right that I have here, a representation of an neutrino signal uh, and uh, a dashed green line uh, that we see in our detector. And on the, uh, the, 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 the red, the red uh, line here, corresponds to, to noise. Uh, we keep events whose uh, peak amplitude is above the, the, the noise floor level by a cer certain, a certain factor. Uh, particularly, we keep those events whose signal to noise ratio, ratio above uh, certain, uh, is above a certain, certain threshold uh, for at least three channels. And signal to noise ratio is defined as the, the peak amplitude in voltage in this case uh, over the noise uh, RMS. Uh, for this analysis, uh, this, the threshold corresponds to an SNR of about six, as you can see in this plot, where I'm plotting the, the, the fraction of events uh, uh, versus the threshold. So 10%, uh, sorry, 1% is around here, which is corresponds to a factor of about six, uh, a threshold of six, sorry. Uh, the second stage in our analysis consisted of reconstructing the direction of, of the radio signal. So note, note here that the direction of the radio signal is not the same as the direction of an neutrino. And, and this is a computationally expensive process. So we only do it for events that has our, our SNR uh, filter. Uh, this method is similar to the interferometric method that, that people in astronomy use. So it relies on the arri arrival uh, delight time delays of the signal across uh, different channels and assigns the correlation value, which I'm calling here uh, C sky, uh, to each direction in, in the sky. So this plot on the right is a sky map of one reconstructing a reconstructed calibration event uh, where uh, the x-axis is the azimuth in degrees, the y-axis is the, uh, the zenith in degrees, and the color axis corresponds to the correlation value. As you can see, the correlation value uh, is maximal at the point where, where the true di direction of the calibration pulsar is. So, so this is good. And this allows, uh, to this allows us to reject uh, calibration events and events of human origin, such as a radio communication and the ice pole uh, in the South Pole, sorry, South Pole station or people with uh, snowmobiles uh, traveling around our stations, which surprisingly we can see. Uh, and then our final cut is a, a bivariate cut. Uh, we expect neutrino events to yield a higher signal strength uh, than noise events and to also reconstruct well. Uh, noise events, usually because they are random, they will not reconstruct well, but because these uh, neutrino events 
have a, a certain are related to each other ac across channels, we uh, they, they do reconstruct well. And we use these features to, to classify our events, as you can see in the plot below. So let me start with the plot on the left, for example. On the x-axis, I'm plotting the signal strength uh, in some units, but this is the signal strength. And on the on the y-axis, I plot the correlation value uh, or C-sky. As a reminder, the higher the C-sky, uh, the better the reconstruction. So we expect neutrinos to live around uh, at, at higher reconstruction values. Uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, sorry, there are two sections. One of them is the signal section or the signal uh, area, which I call pass, or the, the noise uh, region, which I call pass. Uh, as you can see from our analysis, we did not observe any neutrinos in, in, the, in the signal region. So all of them are constrained to our noise region. And if you go to the plot on the right, for example, this is this, this plot corresponds to simulated uh, neutrino events with an energy of one EEV. And as you can see, uh, about 60% of these events are, are in the signal region, which corresponds to the efficiency of our detector at this energy. And as you can see, these events are at high correlation value and at high, uh, at high uh, signal strength. Uh, all right, so the, this plot on the right, uh, we have, I'm plotting the neutrino energy on the y-axis in GeV, and the, the y-axis corresponds to the neutrino flux in, in units of GeV per square centimeter per second per uh, S radian. Uh, we did not find any statistically significant number of events, but we were able to set a 90% upper, 90% uh, confidence upper limit on the all flavor diffuse uh, flux of neutrinos, which is shown by this uh, black line on, on, the, on this plot. I'm also showing the, the latest limits and flux, uh, flux measurements from IceCube with this uh, green uh, data, sorry, not green, blue data points and, and blue uh, line here. Uh, the Pierre OJ Observatory, which is the increased uh, green line, uh, the Ariana experiment, which is another uh, in ice radio experiment on the, uh, with this red line. And then finally, the Anita experiment with this. Uh, uh, yellow line. Uh, for comparison, I'm also showing theoretical predictions for uh, for the different models with these uh, shadow bands and with these dashed lines here. And I'm, finally, I'm also plotting uh, the projected single event sensitivity if we analyze all the data collected by the five stations uh, between 2012 and 2022 uh, of the R experiment. As you can see, uh, R uh, has one of the strongest limits among all the older high energy neutrino, uh, ultra high energy neutrino experiments above uh, 10 to the 8 in GeV. Uh, and from this plot, from this plot, from this line here, you can see that uh, we will have one of the world leading limits uh, by 2022, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, now, the, the experiment, uh, experimental lab landscape, I'm going to skip this slide. I just wanted to say that, uh, that we have not observed any neutrinos so far. But uh, the next generation of experiments are currently uh, being uh, developed, or, or some of them are even being uh, deployed right now, which takes me to the next uh, part of my talk, which is uh, the future of, of the neutrino radio experiments. Uh, there were suggestions that we could bounce uh, radio waves of particle showers, and we, that we could use this to uh, detect the showers produced by, by these ultra high energy neutrinos. So uh, what we did was uh, uh, this uh, T576 experiment, which was designed uh, to experimentally uh, test this. I was part of a team that went to, uh, we went to Slack and, and performed this experiment, which co consisted on uh, directing a beam of GeV electrons into a target of high density uh, plastic. So these electrons, again, are, are going to lose energy, and they will produce a, a, a cascade or a shower of, uh, of other particles. Uh, we place receiving antennas around uh, this target, and we also place a transmitter uh, next to it, and we transmitted uh, and, the, and we broadcasted a signal of known frequency. Uh, so we, it turns out that we observed the reflections. And this is a milestone for uh, the field of radio detection of ultra high energy neutrinos uh, because this provides an entirely new technique 
uh, to detect these uh, neutrinos. And this means that we can instrument large volumes of eyes with a few detection units, which reduces the, the costs of, of the experiments. Uh, so this is what the, the RETCR telescope or the radar echo telescope for cosmic rays uh, is trying to achieve. So this is an experiment based on the radar technique that uh, will hopefully, uh, COVID permitting, uh, be deployed at the South Pole. Uh, the detection concept is depicted on this figure here on the right. Uh, one of these older high energy cosmic rays, uh, uh, this is for uh, to detect cosmic rays. So one of these cosmic rays will interact with the, the atmosphere and produce one of these extensive uh, 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 cosmic ray or air showers. And this shower will propagate and maybe it will eventually uh, uh, transition to the ice near one of our, our, our surface detectors. So these surface detectors will, uh, will uh, send a signal to one of our uh, triggers here and then this will uh, trigger one of the, the transmitters which will broadcast signal and this signal can be uh, detected by bouncing it off this uh, shower. So this is a patch finder for uh, the next generation of neutrino observatories. So if this works well, this will be adapted and used for uh, detecting neutrinos. Um, another important experiment being uh, currently planned is the upgrade to the IceCube uh, observatory, which uh, is named uh, IceCube Gen 2. Uh, so this IceCube Gen 2 will have uh, experiment will have both an optical array, so we'll use optical modules and a radio array, which uh, uses antennas. This figure on the top right uh, shows the proposed layout for this ice cube gen 2. Uh, let's start with this second to last panel. This is the current ice cube. This is about, I think it's 80, I think it's 80 strings uh, containing uh, optical modules. If we want, if, you, if we go one panel to the left, uh, this uh, is about 120 new strings that will be deployed. As you can see, this is one kilometer. So this will, will be of about two, between two and three kilometers long. And if you go to the last panel here, this is what the uh, radio stations will comp uh, comprise. So uh, this configuration will increase the number of events by a factor of 10 uh, compared to the current rate that IceCube measures. And as you can see from this timeline here, uh, the construction is expect expected to begin in 2024 with the first stations taking data by, by the beginning of uh, 2027. Uh, IceCube Gen 2 uh, expects to measure at least three neutron events per year above uh, 10 to the 8 GeV. On the plot on the right, you can see uh, the sensitivity of IceCube Gen 2 with this uh, the radio component, sorry, of IceCube Gen 2 with this uh, red uh, band here. And you can see that these, these sensitivity will dive deep into the sea of theoretical, theoretical models of, of, of the, the origin of these ultra high energy cosmic rays. So this is exciting on the, in the astrophysical uh, perspective, but also the accumulation of events over several years, uh, over several years would allow the study of fundamental physics at uh, these ultra high energies. So uh, finally, uh, my summary, again, I'm biased, but I think this is a very exciting, exciting time for the field of ultra high energy neutrinos. Uh, and this is because there are several experiments uh, being planned. Uh, we are learning from the experience from uh, experiments that were uh, deployed about 10 years ago, but that have been collecting data. And some of them are currently being deployed. For example, the Radio Neutrino Observatory in Greenland. And there is, as, as we are speaking, there is people uh, in Greenland, uh, digging with uh, some shovels and burning antennas. So that's pretty exciting. You can follow them on Twitter. And finally, uh, if you are an astrophysical, for an astrophysical, if you're interested in astrophysics, ultra high energy neutrinos can help us understand the most energetic and distant uh, astrophysical objects. But also, if you, on the other hand, you are into uh, fundamental physics or, or particle physics, uh, using ultra high energy neutrinos as a proof of fundamental physics is, is something that we can also do. Uh, so yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jorge. We have time for a couple of questions. If you have a question, please turn on your microphone and ask directly to Jorge. Yeah. 
If not, I, I have a question about the, the last experiment you described, the new technology in which you inject electrons into a target and uh, that one. So what's the mechanism behind this experiment? What, what's the physics behind? Right, so, so that's, a, a, you know, that's a good question. I, the, the physics here uh, is the same as I described before in uh, one of the, the, I think here. So you have a dielectric medium, which in this okay. case, I describe it as eyes, right? So it can be eyes, it can be uh, silica, but it has to be dielectric. Uh, otherwise you will not observe these uh, radio waves. So uh, the physics is, is the same. So we have, uh, 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 sorry, let me go back to the slide. So we have this target here. So you inject ultra high, sorry, you, you inject, inject uh, high, a very energetic uh, electrons and these electrons will start to lose energy by, by the same mechanisms uh, than in the eyes. However, because this is high density, they will interact faster uh, with the, 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 nu the nuclei here. So this shower will be of the order of maybe one meter, right? Because it's, it's higher density, but it's, it's, it's the same mechanism. So these will act as a, let's call it a plasma uh, that I, I, I don't recall uh, the details, but I think this acts like a conductor. So, you know, like every time you shoot stuff into a conductor, Every time you sh uh, shoot radiation to a conductor, it will bounce off the radiation. So that's that's grosso modo. That's the physics uh, behind this uh, experiment. Thank you very much, Jorge. Yeah. More questions? If there are no more questions, then uh, please unmute your microphones and uh, let's give him an applause. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, uh, we, move, we move to the last speaker of this session. He is Gerardo Hernandez Tomé. Hello, Gerardo. Welcome. And he's going to talk about one loop mechanism for neutrino less double beta decays on hyperons in this process. Uh, he's currently in Simvestav, right? I cannot hear you, Gerardo. I see your screen, but... I cannot hear you. Mm. Now I think I can hear you. No, it's out. I, I think. Okay. It's okay. Let's wait a couple of minutes.
So we are waiting for Gerardo to join again. He had some problems with the connection. Hello, Gerardo. You can hear you, but uh, with a very bad quality. Try to try to unplug your headphones. Okay, let me let me Now, can you hear me better? Better. Okay, so are you seeing my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Sorry. Not, uh, not full screen. Okay, let me, sorry, is I'm using the computer of my wife because I don't know what happened with my computer. I don't know how to share in a full screen. Probably control L or something like that. Okay. No, let me. F5, oh. maybe. F5. No. no. What is? No, don't worry. If if you are comfortable with that format, you, you can do it wherever you're ready. Okay. Uh, okay, let me, give me one second, please. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Uh, okay, I don't know what is happening. Okay, I'm I'm going to start. Sorry for for the inconvenience. Okay, so uh, uh, this is a uh, work done in collaboration with Gabriel Lopez and Diego Portillo from Simvestat. And uh, this is a work that we are finishing, and I hope a. Uh, soon to upload our manuscript to the archive uh, so please stay tuned okay uh, sorry <laughs> sorry i don't know why this happened okay so the outline of the talk is the following first i'm going to give uh, an introduction and motivation i'm going to repeat here very quickly some of the points that avelino had already mentioned so the idea is to introduce a motivation for the search of lepton number violation as a proof of the major and nature of neutrino. Uh, then I'm going to present a, the neutrino less double beta decay in a new model mechanisms that involves a 
hyperons that involve baryons and uh, neutrinos as uh, intermediate states, I'm going to present a comparison of our results with previous estimation. And uh, finally, I'm going to present a summary and the conclusion of the work. So, uh, as we know, in the original formulation of the standard model, neutrinos are uh, massless particles. This is because the no incorporation of the right hand components for neutrinos. So, in this minimal scenario, we have that both lepton number and lepton flavor are accidental conserved quantities and any perturbation theory. But uh, today we know that this is not completely true, but because uh, we have the experimental evidence of neutrino oscillation. So, in fact, neutrinos are massive particles with a tiny mass in comparison with the rest of the fermions, but not zero. And also, if neutrino oscillates, then a, a lepton flavor is not conserved, at least in the neutrino sector, even though lepton flavor involving char uh, leptons has not been observed. But the point is, we need to consider an extension to the standard model that incorporates massive neutrinos. And of course, the immediate solution is just to add the right hand components for neutrinos and generate their masses via uh, Yukawa couplings, just as a proof for the rest of the particles. Uh, I mean, via the, uh, the Higgs mechanism. But uh, 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 the problem, the question now is why the mass of the neutrinos is so small in comparison with all the other particles. So as Avelino already mentioned, we can just assume very small Yukawa couplings and explain their masses. But neutrinos are different of the rest of the particles in the way that uh, uh, the SU2 singlet requires to give an electroweak mass is not protected by chirality. So in principle, the right-hand components for neutrinos allow, sorry, uh, allow the presence of Majorana mass terms given by the, the equation number one. So uh, it is clear now that in this scenario, this, this uh, ter Majorana terms breaks a uh, lepton number explicitly in two units, but in principle, there is no uh, fundamental reason to prohibit them. In the standard model, lepton number is just an accidental symmetry. So in this way, uh, any observation of lepton number violation is viewed as a proof of the Majorana nature for neutrinos. And the most sensitive laboratory to, uh, to test the effects of very light Majorana neutrinos uh, is a neutrino less double beta decay in nucleus. What we have here is that a nucleus with a number F of nucleons from which C are uh, protons transmute in another nucleus with the number uh, with the same with the same number of nucleons, but with C plus two protons and the emission of two electrons. Now know that this uh, transition only occurs if neutrinos are major and particles, and it's different from the double beta decays with two neutrinos. In this later transition, lepton number is conserved and uh, it can be uh, occurred through a standard interaction. Well, the important point is in the neutrino less case, what we have is that the half lifetime for this transition is proportional to the square of the effective Majorana mass parameter, which is defined by the equation number three. Uh, so in this case, uh, the no observation of, uh, of this transition set strong limits on this quantity. Uh, another uh, interesting a point to mention is that uh, in this case, the nuclear matrix elements from a theoretical point of view are difficult to compute with a strong model dependence. So this makes it difficult to do a right interpretation of the experimental limits. Okay, uh, on the other hand, 
there are also another interesting uh, searches for lepton number violation, as for example, uh, there is a lot of work uh, studying the, the case of a meson into a lighter meson and a pair of charged leptons of the same electric charge, or the decay of a tau into a lighter charged leptons and a pair of, of, of lighter mesons again with the same electric charge. And basically all this process occur by the same uh, interaction. What, what we have is a two W bosons that attach to the extremes of a uh, major and aligned fermions and two char uh, leptons. But uh, the important point in these transitions is uh, they study the effects of a heavy Majorana neutrino with a mass around 100 MeV to 5 GeV, where this uh, new heavy states can be produced on cell, on shell. So there could be a resonant enhancement in this case, which can be possible to observe this kind of transition in a current or future experiment. But so far, uh, this kind of transitions uh, have, have been searched in several uh, experiments and we don't have any evidence of them. So the most restrictive limits today uh, are, for example, for the decay of a kaon into a pion or in a pair of electrons or muons, which uh, the limits are of the order of 10 to minus 10 uh, and 10 to minus 11. Uh, and again, now the observation of this transition now set a limit on the mass of these new heavy states versus the heavy light mixing. But these limits are only valid for the mass region where the mass of the neutrino, uh, if, if, if the neutrino can be produced on shell in the phase space parameter of this decay. Okay, now in this work, we are interested in other lepton number violating effects. We are interested in neutrino less W beta decay, not in nuclei but in hyperons. Now, these decays can be classified according to their change on uh, strangeness, just as is divided in this table. So, of course, these transitions are much less sensitive than those in nucleus, but with the main advantage that the nuclear matrix elements involved here, uh, may be simpler to compute from a theoretical point of view, and this can help us to understand the underlying me mechanism behind this uh, transition. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this uh, transition also allows the possibility to study channels involving uh, muons uh, the, in the final state that are not available in, in, in nuclear decay. Um, okay, and um, as the same way that in nuclei, we can also have we can also have a double beta decay with the emission of two neutrinos. But in this world, we are going to focus in the neutrino less case. So another motivation for for the study of this uh, transition is that they play a relevant role in the hyperon physics program of the best three collaboration. So best three is an electron positron collider that works as a factory of Jepsi and Psi2S particles. Uh, they are expecting to accumulate around 10 to 10 events per year and, and around a fraction of 10 to minus 3 of all the decays of these particles goes to a pair of hyperons. So they also are in this way a, 
a factory of after of hyperons. So they are going to be able to study rare or forbidden decays of, of hyperons with a with a, a good uh, sensitivity. In particular, uh, they are going to be able to set limits on lepton number violating transitions of hyperons of the order of 10 to minus uh, 5 to 10 to minus 8. So, for example, the last year they report uh, their first limit uh, for the channel of a sigma minus to PEE, which is around of the order of 10 to minus 5. And now with this this data joined to the only previous uh, limit for this kind of transition reported in the 2005 year for the IPRC collaboration, which is the most stringent limit that is of the order of 10 to minus 8 for this channel. Okay, uh, as far as the theoretical previous work reported in the literature, in the literature for the study of these transitions, uh, as far as we know, all, uh, all this work is contained in only three previous papers. So in the first one, in this reference, uh, the authors consider an effective loop model mechanism uh, involving baryon and majorana neutrinos as intermediate state. The idea is, here is to consider baryons as the relevant degrees of freedom. Uh, and in, as a first approximation in this reference, the authors consider that the hadronic vector and axial transition form factors that define the weak vertices in this figure, uh, they consider as constant functions. So in this approximation, what they found is that the loop integrals uh, have an ultraviolet divergent behavior. And they consider just a simple cut-off procedure to, to deal with this divergence. Uh, on the other hand, a few years later, the same authors uh, gave another estimation, but this time based on the back model. So in this case, they consider the most general dimension nine Lagrangian involving six fermions. Uh, and they compute the hadronic matrix elements uh, between four quarks, as I already mentioned, using the, the back model. So they consider reasonable values for the Wilson coefficients and the new heavy scale. Uh, but what we have here is that uh, the result of these two previous estimations are rather different. So as we can see in the loop model, they obtain a branching ratio for the channel of a sigma minus to PEE of the order of 10 to minus 33. And in the uh, back model, they obtain a, a value of 10 order of magnitudes greater. So our objective in this work is to provide a, an estimation for the loop model mechanism but incorporating the Q squared dependence of the hadronic transition form factors. So let me try to explain this uh, with more details. So if a neutrino less double beta decay of hyperon is triggered by this mechanism, the amplitude can be written by equation number nine, uh, where here we have defined this G factor as one of these combinations uh, that is classified according to the church on strangeness of the different channels. Now, the leptonic sector uh, is just given by the equation 11, but the relevant part of the computation is given in the hadronic current. So here, just for com convenience, we have introduced this constant that comes from the le uh, leptonic current in the hadronic uh, part. Uh, now, what we can see here is that uh, the loop integral, uh, in general, depend of the structure of the 
axial of the vector and axial hadronic form factors. Uh, okay, and these factors parametrize the vector and axial hadronic current respectively. So the, uh, here it's important to mention that a similar loop a mechanism has been uh, employed to study the long distance contribution to the decay of a cation into a pion and a pair of neutrinos in this reference. Uh, actually, uh, they found the same uh, divergent one loop functions when they consider that the hadronic, uh, uh, the, when they consider constant the hadronic uh, vector and actual form factor. And they use also this type of approximation that we are going to use and that I'm going to, I'm going to try to explain um, in the next slide uh, to deal with the ultraviolet divergence that appears. So uh, in this uh, slide, I show, uh, okay, the, all the different intermediate uh, variants for all the different transitions that we are studying here. And we also can see uh, the values for the hadronic uh, vector and axial form factors in the approximation of zero momentum transfers. These values are going to be useful to, to give an estimation. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, the, the important point here is after the loop integral, the hadronic part can be expressed as the equation number 14, where what we have here is that uh, this C eta function encode all the effects of the strong interaction relevant in the, in the loop computation. So we are going to see what is the, what are the expressions of this function in, in the difference approximation. So in the first approximation, where you consider the hadronic form factor as constant functions, you have that these relevant loop functions appearing at the amplitude level are given in terms of the two points B0 and B1 Pasarino Bellman functions. But we know that these functions are uh, ultraviolet divergent. And as I mentioned, in this uh, work, they use just a simple cut-off procedure to, to deal with the divergence. Now, we know that a better estimation uh, consists in consider the Q squared dependence of these uh, functions. So in this case, we are consider a, a type pole approximation given by expression uh, 20. So where here this M's acts a regulator masses and uh, their values have been reported in the literature. So here we are using this approximation. So under this approach, what we have is that the relevant loop function describing the uh, loop mechanism for neutrino less double beta decay are given in terms of uh, Pasarino Bellman function of four points. So, I mean, the D0 function. And this function uh, are well behaved. I mean, they are free of ultraviolet divergence. Okay, so. Let me try to explain this with more detail. Sorry, I forget to mention one important point in the previous slide. Uh, something that is important here is that here we are not considered any approximation in the loop integral. I mean, we are keeping the dependence of the neutrino mass in the, in the loop integral. 
So this is going to be useful to explore two different scenarios, as we will see. So in this plot, uh, I'm showing the behavior of these loop functions uh, as a function of the mass of the of the of the neutrino of the intermediate ne neutrino in the in the loop. What we can see here, uh, here I'm I'm showing uh, the case or the, the vectorial contributions. But and, and just to illustrate and consider the transition of a sigma minus to a proton, but uh, we have verified that similar plots are uh, obtained for all the other transitions that we are studying here. And also that uh, the, contrib the actual contributions have the same uh, behavior. Uh, okay. Mm, two important points uh, we can see in this plot. So first, uh, we see that all the dominant contributions come from the C B zero or the C A zero functions, and also what we can see is that for a small neutrino masses, I mean neutrino masses below of one hundred MeV these uh, loop functions are insensitive to the ground of the mass of the neutrino. Okay, so now uh, the relevant uh, factors appearing at the amplitude are given by this combination, even in equation 25. So now we can uh, split uh, our analysis in two interesting uh, scenarios. So we consider the case of three light active neutrinos. So in this case, uh, we can uh, consider as an approximation of the equation 25 that this combination can be approximate by the effective Majorana mass times the loop function uh, neglecting in the loop function the mass of the neutrino. Uh, as I already mentioned, this is well justified because for a small uh, masses of the neutrinos, the loop integrals are insensitive to the growth of the mass of the neutrinos. So in this case, we call this the scenario A. We can just simply consider the direct limit on the effective Majorana mass. On the other hand, uh, we can also extend our analysis by studying the effects of heavy Majorana masses in a lower scale CISO model. So in this case, we have to uh, split the contribution of the light neutrinos plus the contribution of the heavy states as is divided in equation 29. Now, in order to size these effects, we are considering a minimal parametrization uh, that has been, that uh, we have presented in this reference. So in this minimal scenario, what we have here is that the neutrino sector is composed of five Majorana states. Uh, okay, and three of these uh, Majorana neutrinos are going to be associated with the active neutrinos of the standard model, and we are going to have two heavy states. Now, note that in this scenario, the active neutrinos are exactly massless, and as I mentioned, this is not true, but here we are not trying to explain the mass of the neutrinos, but rather we are trying to uh, study the effects of heavy Majorana neutrinos, the genuine effects of lepton number violation due to heavy Majorana masses. So in this minimal parametrization, what we have is 
uh, all the phenomenology is described in terms of five independent free parameters. We have three heavy light mixings and we have two heavy Majorana uh, states. Uh, now, uh, when the masses of these two states is the same, what we have in reality is a direct singlet. So in that case, all the, uh, all the lepton number violated effects uh, can be uh, studied by the splitting of the mass of these two new states. Now the matrix elements involved in the new heavy state, the mixing of the new heavy states uh, can be expressed according to the equation 30. And now uh, to size these effects, we are consider the indirect limit on the heavy light mixing angles, which are given by the equation 31. But we also have to consider uh, the perturbative unitary limit. I mean, we cannot consider arbitrary mass admissions for these new heavy states. So in this minimal parametrization, that condition uh, translates in this relation. And if we assume the maximum value for the, for the indirect limits, what we have is uh, this relation. Now, Finally, in this uh, plot, what I show is uh, just the effects of two non-degenerate heavy Majorana neutrinos. So here I'm plotting the relevant uh, factor appearing at the amplitude level. And as we can see, I'm assuming to uh, but two values for the for the Majorana states around few TVs where the mixing of the heavy light mixing are less restrictive and uh, I am uh, plotting this factor as a function of the splitting of these two states. What we can see here is that as already mentioned, the mass of these two heavy states is the same, so lepton number is conserved, and this kind of transition is exactly zero, just as occurred here. Uh, okay. Uh, well, what we have found is, uh, considering this uh, limit, we have found a preliminary results for the maximum branching ratio in these two uh, scenarios. So the values that we have obtained are given by this table. Uh, something that we can mention here is that uh, for the uh, scenario A, for the uh, scenario A, sorry, uh, we have that um, uh, the channels involving two electrons are uh, very uh, are very the branch and ratio for this transition are very tiny but because the limits that come from the nuclear uh, double beta decays are very restrictive so uh, on the other hand we can have that the channels involving two muons uh, can be considerably greater but that is because the limits on the effective Majorana mass involving ions is much less restrictive. Uh, okay, so let me conclude, sorry. So what we have done in this work is we have studied the neutrino less double beta decay of hyperons arising from an effective loop model mechanism with baryons and Majorana neutrinos as intermediate state. Uh, uh, our results impro improves previous estimations. Uh, we consider a single pole structure uh, for the dependence of the intermediate hadron four factors, which is based on in electron nucleon scattering experiment. So this cures the ultraviolet divergent behavior appearing in previous work and add us to a more reliable estimates of the branching ratio. So we also explore the genuine effects of heavy Majorana masses 
in a low scale scenario. So now the effects studied in this work are far away from the sensitivity of the current experiments, then we can conclude that any positive signal of lepton number violation in hyperon case, it would be attributed to a different type of new physics. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gerardo. We have time for a couple of questions. If you have one question, you can turn on your microphone and ask directly to Gerardo. If there are no questions, then uh, I have a comment. I think this, this is a very, very nice scenario to, to prove uh, several models of uh, beyond standard model physics, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a very, very interesting playground. So, uh, very nice work. Uh, thank you very much, Gerardo. And thank you. This, we conclude this, this session. I encourage you to turn on your microphone and give him uh, an applause. Thank you, Gerardo. Hi. You're welcome. See you. Sorry for the inconvenience. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, uh, with this we, we finish this session and we will come back at four, I think. Mm. Four. Yes. Bye. Bye, thank you.